Trigger warning. The first 11 minutes of this podcast contains content that may disturb some listeners that have a sensitivity to conversations about suicide. If you fit this description, or would just rather not hear about it right now, skip to time code 1215 to steer clear. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy this double length episode of TOFOP. The following episode of TOFOP is rated MA. It may contain Batman references, time travel references, sexual references, lost trains of thought, and mild coarse language. TOFOP advises that the program is not suitable for anyone under the age of 15 or anyone who enjoys succinct, coherent conversation that might actually have a point. Minors must be accompanied by a parent, guardian, or priest. This is John Deke speaking. Everyone relax, this is Tofop, I'm Charlie Clawson. I'm Will Anderson, hello. Hi. That was a nice little little start because I want to start with a bit of sad news. Um, I, I want to pay tribute to uh, Chris Cornell. Oh, man, uh, and yeah. obviously, uh, for, look, we, it's hard to talk about this without talking about suicide. Uh, so uh, for anyone who's like, I thought we might as well just talk about it up the top. Therefore, if you're the sort of person who's like, does not want to think about that topic or you're a sort of person who's going through hard times, please, you know, ring lifeline, talk to somebody, you know, do that sort of stuff. Um, and you can tune back in, in the podcast in five minutes. That, five minutes. Okay. okay. Yeah. I reckon. <laughs> well, you know, you'll probably look, you know, around there. Yeah. Um, were you a big, uh, Chris Cornell fan? What was your, uh, well, Soundgarden, obviously like I, that, Chris Cornell, to me, I was thinking about, I've been listening to Soundgarden all this morning. Yeah, me too. And I was like, oh my God, you know when, I mean, you always, um, you always romanticize your teens, but listening to Soundgarden this morning, I was like, fuck this, like, this feels like home. Like, this is so comfortable. And his voice to me summed up that era of rock and roll that I grew up in. You're like, it's one of those things where when you listen to his voice and how amazingly talented musician he clearly was, but like his voice in particular, like, because yeah. when you think of those grunge era bands, you're not necessarily, although, you know, you, you could argue that Kurt Cobain has a good singing voice and you could certainly argue that Eddie Vedder has a good singing yeah. voice, but it wasn't that classic rock voice that, you know, Freddie Mercury can, you know, hit high notes. And well, that, Freddie Mercury is a good example, right? Yeah. I, well, I always thought he was the grunge version of Freddie Mercury. Just that voice is incredible. And like one of the best screams, like Spoon oh. Man, the sustained scream in Spoon Man is incredible. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, it, just in Black Hole Sun, you know, where like in the, when it comes home, when he starts doing that screaming. Yeah. It's, I was listening to that this morning as I was driving around and just going, I mean, I was lucky enough. I tweeted twice yesterday, like one to just say, oh, no. And mm. the second one was, uh, well, the first one said, oh, no, I, I was lucky enough to meet him. And he was like, he seemed like a really cool guy and whatever. And then the other one, I, like I told an anecdote, which I'm going to tell on this podcast. But mm. this morning, because it's the internet, I had one person kind of go, oh, making it all about you, aren't you? And I was like, really? No, oh, no. The grief police? Yeah. I was like, Oh, no. you're not allowed to mourn someone you weren't best friends with. Or didn't you know that? Right. But also the other thing about it was both of those things that I shared were about him, not about me. Yeah. Like I, the only reason I shared the anecdote wasn't to go like, hey, um, I also was in Chris Cornell's life. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I have worked for radio stations where we interview people. Yeah. The revelation that at some stage I interviewed somebody isn't me really adding anything to my CV that people might not be aware of <laughs> if they think about it for a second, right? Yeah. And I wanted to tell this story because it was just the coolest story. So I only got to, I saw him, I was very lucky to see him in Soundgarden. I saw him in Audio Slave. I saw him solo uh, on one of my computers here at the house. There are... I would say a thousand photos with him without his shirt on. <laughs> like if you just came and found my computer, because that night it's fair to say, Amy was like, it, as soon as he took his shirt off, Amy like just pushed that <laughs> button where it's like a thousand photos Burst. at once. Yeah. And if you found my computer, if I died and they were going through my stuff, uh, you would find enough shirtless Chris Cornell <laughs> photos to think that I had a serious Chris Cornell <laughs> issue. Um, he was an amazing, amazing singer, but um, yeah, I only got to meet him that once. And um 
Uh, it was a, he was uh, doing interviews for Audio Slave. So the guys, you know, some of the guys from Rage Against the Machine, and he was like singing out the front. And uh, we went to a hotel. They're doing like a series of those interviews where you know they're in the same hotel room and they a just, junket. Yeah, they're doing a junket, right? And the, it, you, the kind of the space they were in. Like, they're very rock and roll, you know, guys, a super group of, like, two of the biggest, you know, rock and roll bands of all time, right? You know, this is, like, a an amazing rock and roll royalty sort of room. Rage Against the Machine, you know, meets Soundgarden. But this hotel was, like, the poshest, mm-hmm. like, you know, you know, afternoon tea with scones and little cakes sort of hotel that you will ever see in your entire life. So... They're in this room and they're all, they've jammed them all onto one couch because the way that, to do the interviews, all four of them, even though like one of them is not going to say anything for the entire thing, all four of them are on this like couch. And Chris is sitting three in and he's drinking a cup of tea. Um, but it, like because of the nature of the hotel, it's got um, <laughs> Winnie. In honour of Chris Cornell, uh, Winnie's trashing the room. <laughs> In pure rock and roll fashion. Winnie's Rindy, being very rock and roll right now, <laughs> aren't you? Making as much noise as you can in the middle of it. Yeah, okay. Maybe just take that outside. Yeah, that's right. Um, all right. So um, He's drinking tea. He's drinking tea. And they've given him a saucer and like a really dainty teacup. And so during the interview when he's not talking, he's finished his tea. And when I guess Adam, you know, whoever it was I was interviewing with, is asking his question so all i'm doing is watch chris cornell as he tries to like he tries to lean forward to put it like on the um on the table in front but it's too far away he can't get to the table in front and then he tries to lean down to put it on the ground but because they've jammed all four of them on this couch to move down to the ground the others would, in. well the others would literally Pop collapse into each other yeah right like so he would go down and they would just smash heads next door like a marx brothers routine right so he's wrestling with this problem and then in the most rock and roll like moment of all time. You literally saw it come across his face where he just realized, oh, I'm Chris Cornell. I'm like a rock and roll superstar. And then he just tosses, not in a grandiose way, not like in an angrily against the wall, but literally just tosses it over his shoulder in a way that goes, well, that is someone else's problem. Now. <laughs> where did it land? Like just on the carpet, I guess, over the back of the couch. Didn't break? No, it was very... Like, the way you did it was... Like, if you're going to throw a teacup over... Throw it, it was the most subtle throw of a teacup off a couch you will ever see in your entire life. And to me, it was just like one of those moments where I was like, he didn't want to make a rock, rock and roll fuss, but there was eventually a point where he went, ah, fuck it. Well, you know, I think if you've been in a rock and roll band for years... Uh, you've gotten used to ditching your drugs when the cops get on your tour bus, right. so he's very used to just throwing shit over yeah. his shoulder. Pretend it's drugs. Oh, yeah, that works. Yeah, right? Tea's kind of a drug. There's caffeine in it. Um, yeah, so it was very sad to hear the news. And um, uh, yeah, it, it's one of those great things, though. I mean, if you can look to an upside of these sort of things is that idea that um, for fans, not for family and friends and those people who are mourning like someone they actually knew, but for fans, it's an opportunity to reconnect with their music and their work and like today you know just going through reading articles and you know things that people have posted i've found heaps of you know there's a beautiful version of him singing an acoustic version of nothing compares to you yeah, yeah. which is like again if you want to talk about how good it's funny we've was. had the same kind of morning because yeah. i was rolling stone listed like the uh, like eight uh, cover song acoustic covers he'd done so i watched him do i will always love you <laughs> did you see him do one yes like where he does the, yeah, the u2 one to the youtube yeah <laughs> That was a funny bit. It's awesome. I was like, you could be in Tripod. <laughs> that would have been a great Melbourne Comedy Festival. <laughs> Tripod and Chris Cornell. I would have gone to say that. It, um, it's funny. When you look back at sort of who's like the bands that we grew up in and who's died over the last, you know, yeah. 10 years or so. I guess you can't help but think when you first see that band or, you know, when you first get into a band that they're kind of immortal. Right. And then... Well, Chris Cornell in particular, he didn't look like a guy who... No, I know he'd he had some, like, you know, uh, drug issues and stuff like that, but he kind of looked like one of those guys. He had a, a wife and a family and, like, he looked fit as fuck. When, when he got his hair cut, yeah. I was like, oh, you're, you're, like, oh, you're, you're fine. Very, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've got a bob now. Yeah. You're going to be fine. <laughs> but then when they, they pass away, it's just like... It's a, you can't help but go, oh, shit. It's like friends of mine who have kids, and I'm like, wow, what you've got there is a little... Uh, a, a little timer of your own mortality. As that kid gets older, you're getting. Uh, as that kid gets older, you're getting closer to death. Right. And as all these kind of touchstones, these cultural icons of our youth, pass away, it's like, oh my god, the, the feeling of irrelevance is creeping up on me right. like every single day. When I was in Target and you could 
buy like a Kurt Cobain singlet. Like, you know, there's a stencil of Kurt Cobain on the singlet in Target for like 15 bucks. I was like, wow, my generation is officially, we are irrelevant. Like there is something going on. There's a music scene and there's art getting made and there's a cultural movement that I know nothing about. And I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be that uncle complaining about the noise or whatever, because uh, real bands was when I was a teenager. Like real bands was in the nineties. That was real music. I, I'm going to murder this, but I saw like a, a quite a nice joke go around, it, you know, and it wasn't particularly about, you know, the death of Chris Cornell, but it was a good example of how you can talk about the moment without, you know, specifically kind of targeting the person or whatever. And, um, and it was along that theme and I'm going to murder it, but this was the gist of it, which was um, uh, for anyone who doesn't under, uh, for any millennials, who don't understand, you know, the death of Chris Cornell, just then imagine it's whatever shitty DJ you like. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, you've really summed up a lot of my thoughts there, mate. I'm not sure I have a philosophy, but if I was going to get something tattooed on me in like uh, Japanese letters, it might be that. Don't you feel like that? But that attack that people have on millennials, especially from our Gen X generation, like, I don't know if Gen X attack the millennials as much as the well, boomers. Not, well, do. the boomers, yeah. But they, very much the boomers. They attack the, everyone. And the older Gen X. I reckon Gen X are pretty cool with the boomers. I reckon a lot of Gen X wishes they could still hang out with the, oh, sorry, hang out with the millennials. Like oh, yeah, no, like, definitely. Know, like, yeah, I wish the millennials yeah. would invite me to, their, to see their cool bands. Yeah, but, we're, but we're I, like, oh, you know, we're still man children. Yeah. We can still <laughs> come to your things. We don't have kids. We don't. Look at our lives. We still think we're you. We do Invite a, us to stuff. We do a fake radio show. Explain how it works. Yeah, we're on social media. We get it, guys. Snapchat and stuff, right? But I often hear people my age like bitching and moaning about millennials and the entitled generation and blah, blah, blah. As if that wasn't said about oh, us. Every generation. Every generation. Every generation. And it's it's weird. Please, it's... please never let me be one of those people who I had a whole defending millennials bit in my stand-up show this year. And it was along that line of just me thinking, I don't ever want to be that person who looks at young people and thinks, because you know what? They're, over the generations, I think every generation is about seven IQ points smarter. They're the people who are going to solve this next thing. They're going to be the next incarnation of us for good or for ill. Mm. So we might as well help them so it's for good. Yeah. That's our legacy. Yeah. You know, whatever they are. Have you ever tried to, like, when you were a teenager or whatever, did you ever try? I feel and- like we've moved on to. So we actually made 10 minutes. So sorry to anyone I said five <laughs> minutes. But... um. Uh, I think we've official. We can. Well, we'll, we'll get we'll get Mike out of time coded yeah. so people know. Yeah. Um. But did you have a, a time when you were a teenager where you tried to get your parents into your music or play them any of your music or was there any attempt to sort of bridge that generation gap? I got to be honest with you, my my dad never listens to music. Right. Like he is not a music listener. My mum had a one of the weirdest, widest varieties of tastes of music of all time. She loved everything from John Williamson to the ABBA soundtrack to Queen to yeah right like yeah there was a real. Yeah, Meat Loaf's Bad Out of Hell was in her. Nana Muscuri. It was like... Yeah. It was kind of one of those things where, you know, if you saw it in a movie now and they wanted to establish someone as like a hot pixie girl alternative. Yeah, right. They would 500 all, Days of Summer. Yeah, yeah, they would almost have, yeah. 500 Days of Christine, the Christine <laughs> Anderson story. All 500 set on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mix between Castaway and 500 Days of Summer. But I think that was because Dad didn't listen to music. So she never yeah. really... She, she'd find a few things and she'd get into it, but she'd never really... Well, that was like my mum and dad. Like I don't really recall... Legend has it in my family that my dad, his one popular music purchase um, was the village people and that my sister and my brother walked in with to dad putting the village people on and having a bit of groove around the living room and then they explained to him that they're gay and then my dad was snapping that record in half and throwing it in the bin. Lovely message to the <laughs> four kids in your family who end up being gay, right? Oh, it all worked out. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Could have had his own little village people. But then mum had more diverse taste. She like was definitely into, she liked really old music, like classical music uh-huh. and stuff. But then she had some like Beatles, Van Morrison. But I'd say she peaked out around early 70s. Oh, mum liked the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, doesn't isn't that like a foregone conclusion? I don't think we had any Rolling Stones in the house though. So I think she'd made a choice. There. No. We had, from mum's collection, I think it went as far as like the late 60s. Then as the kids grew up, we started getting more like Led Zeppelin and Skyhooks and stuff like the that. The thing about the Beatles and like, you know, when you, you go, you, your mum liked the Beatles. The thing I love about that though is like the Beatles, like yes, obviously early on they had some pretty simple pop songs, but eventually they became one of the most 
you know, musically innovative and interesting bands of all time. And yeah. their influence has been writ large in the history of pop music. You know, yeah. there is probably no more important a band well, ever that, than that, the Beatles. Well, on that right? Rolling Stone article, there's Chris Cornell doing a cover of A Day in the Life. And I listened to that this morning and I was like, oh my God, like... This could have been recorded now. Like, if Radiohead put out fucking half of the stuff that the Beatles put out in the last half of their career now, you'd be like, oh, yeah, right. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Concept album. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's like a brilliant, brilliant band. So that meant that our parents had that access to this world where they were still, even if they weren't interested in music, experiencing really interesting music. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I maybe, and this is an old person thing to say, yeah. but sometimes I feel like the kids of today aren't being served as well by that. You know, yeah, in, sure. in the, the band that you're into just by accident, because you like one or two bands, they're probably not as good as, you know, a band that you, you're still hearing really, really excellent stuff. Yeah. Like, I mean, the, the thing you could say about U2, regardless of, you know, whatever feel, people feel about U2, is when U2 were producing top of the charts pop music, it was still very interesting and like complex and like, you know, whatever music mm. that you would just, even if you just like U2, yeah, like yeah. my favorite band's U2, you still got to hear some pretty decent, so, interesting music. And they at least, and they tried different sounds and yeah. stuff. But well, I think with mum, like I remember distinctly when I was like 18, playing her a selection of my music to see what she thought of it. And like mum, I think the most modern album mum had was like, a, God, who was that Australian band? Is it Weddings, Parties, Anything? Yeah. I think mum... I liked Weddings, Parties, Anything. Yeah. <laughs> so you and my mum had that in common. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See, I always, I always liked your mum. Could have taken her to a Weddows gig. <laughs> One of those Christmas gigs they used to do. They were really legendary. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. They would sell out months in advance. Yeah, right. Yeah, I loved... Uh, I remember... Well, talk- she, liked things, she likes over the folky edge. She really loved Van Morrison. Um, so I played her some Guns N' Roses, um, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Metallica... And then I went into um, LL Cool J, Beastie Boys, and then finished off with some techno. Not that I was into techno, but I just wanted to see. Where would you go with techno? Like, are you talking uh, like crossover techno, like the Prodigy or Fat Boy Slim or something? Uh, or actually, no, like, I think it was techno. No, techno. It was like proper. Ha- it was proper house music. House My brother music. had brought back. Be pretty amazing if your mum just discovered she was into <laughs> fucking hardcore house. Well, the way that I remember her ranking it was she. The the heavy the heavy metal she liked best because Metallica even though it's heavy it's very musical you know yeah, like it could be orchestral like it sounds closer to classical yeah. then next came sort of grunge like Nirvana and Metallica because she liked the lyrics wasn't a big fan of hip hop Beastie Boys too shouty which you know yeah I mean I mean that's fair enough shouting. like you've got if you you know if you don't I have mean, people shouting yeah, at you I I would say that like even the Beastie Boys themselves would have sat around and go hey look we're not like we're not for people that don't like shouting yeah she like LL Cool J yeah well he's not very shouty no and it's also very relaxed well, we, and it, you know what also what? according to the technical <laughs> contract ladies love Cool James yeah so. that's true. How she, could she resist? She she uh she, at the at the end of when I played at LL Cool J, she turned and punched me in the face, and I said, yeah. "What was that for?" And she said, "Well, LL said, said knock you out." Mama said, "Knock you out." <laughs> uh, and then the techno, which was just a collection of house music, I can't remember. It was like one of those, you know, grab bag CDs, and she didn't like that at all. No. She she thought it sounded like a dentist drill. You should have said to her mum, "What you got to go do is go to your medicine cabinet, take <laughs> all your pills, mix them with a the wine, then get back to me about how you like it." <laughs> That's why I always feel bad when people get busted for drugs, pretty much anywhere. But when people get busted for drugs at dance music festivals, you know, when they confiscate, and I'm just like, oh. You have to endure that whole fucking... I mean, like, fucking... if, you, if your drugs get confiscated the big day out, you can still go and have a good time. <laughs> <But> <laughs> might as well go home if your drugs get confiscated at a dance music festival. Now, You're like, I shredded for three months for this. <laughs> hey, uh, do you have something? Is that what you were about to say? Oh, no. I was just oh. going to say it's, uh, um, it's a banner day uh, for Tofop because... Uh, uh, why? Well, yesterday you told me you loved me. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, go with this if you'd like. <laughs> That's fine. I'm happy for that. I will not. I was, I, I was really pleased. I got a text message from Will saying, I love you and uh, sorry the fuckers are ruining your day. I was like, oh, that's nice. Um, my day's not that bad. So I said, um, thanks, man. I love you too. Well, also the other thing was that I, because we were going to record this yesterday and then uh, some fuckers had started ruining someone else's day <laughs> and I had stepped in to uh, uh, undo the fuckery. Yeah, undo some of the fuckery. <laughs> like I could not undo all the fuckery, but I could play a support role yeah. in uh, just being there. Yeah. Uh, and a part of that support role was uh, me uh, being on the phone at the supermarket trying to get the... Uh, the bath soap 
that the person who had been the subject of the fuckery enjoys because I thought it'd be nice after they got a home from a day of fuckery yeah. to be able to use the bus Victim so of that fuckery. she enjoys, right? Yeah. And uh, so I, uh, it was not available at either of the two places that stock it in the suburbs that we live nearby. Mm-hmm. And I'd gone to both of them. Yeah. And uh, then I'd been in the shop and uh, there'd been some more, uh, I'd, be, I'd been delivered some uh, uh, late breaking news on the fuckery. <laughs> And uh, I had also at that uh, around that same time uh, sent you a message saying, "Hey, can we do this tomorrow?" Right? Yeah. So you had a lot on your plate. You had, had multiple plate, multiple message windows also, going. Also, well, yeah. The, the, well, the two that had can been I, most recently used. Can I ask? Was the message sent from your phone or from your laptop? From my phone. I was at the right. supermarket okay. on the phone at the time. Because I listen to a podcast as well. Because I, I like to multifunction on always. Successful. I have my text hooked up to my laptop, uh-huh. and so I can, you know, when I'm working, I can sort of text people at the same time. And I find more often than not, that's when I send the message to the wrong people, is because you can open up Windows, and it's not you don't have to go in and select the person's name. You're just sort of grabbing and you know you're swapping Windows and chatting back and forth. And I have sent numerous messages to the wrong person. Never told anyone I loved them. Um, I was disappointed when I realized within about 1.3 seconds. You. I love you. <laughs> oh, Do you need to hear that? No, no. No, no. You know, you know <laughs> I know that, man. You, you know, know I love you, baby. You know, <laughs> you've been fucking doing this unsuccessfully for seven years. If there's nothing else, this is longer than most relationships. We haven't had our seven year itch. <laughs> well, we kind of did. We're we pe- broke up for a while. Yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> you were seeing someone else who wouldn't let you hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that there should be a function... The amount of times I have sent texts and be like, like oh, retract, literally retract text happened last week. Immediate uh, retract, I had some 30 fri- second retract or something. Yeah. Like I had friends around uh, last week. It's a good app. If and you could come up with that as an app. Cause you wouldn't yeah. get it. Cause you can't, you should be able to zap it. Here's what I'd imagine is you can't do it. A, a, you a can't get it back, right? Yeah. I don't really understand how it works, but I imagine the minute you've sent it, it's already in the other person's thing or in the world. So you can't retract it. But what if you put a thing, it's like a guard that you put on your phone and all it just means is, like you, like radio delay, you know how radio has mm, like a seven second, second or six yeah. or whatever it is delay. So what that means is if you ring up and say fuck on air, right? They can push the dump button. They lose that six seconds and you come back as if it was like you know, yeah business as usual. But then at the end of the normally what happens is then to get they have to go in a song or an ad or whatever so they can, they can go back into delay. Um, the best time to ever swear on air if you want a tip is immediately after someone else has sworn on air because they probably haven't. Uh, managed to reset the delay. So you're probably going live there for a little while if anyone needs a tip. But um, you, you put that kind of on your phone. So whatever the app is, you upload this app and it puts your phone on that 30 second delay. So yeah. the thing actually hasn't been sent sure. until 30 it's seconds just a bu- after you it's send a buffer. it. Right? It's a buffer. Yeah. I think that's a good app. That's not idea. a bad idea for an app, I think that's right? a good app. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Or you could, if you wanted to make it kind of... Because you give more- it some name like Second Thoughts or like... Yeah, that's uh, right. You know... Yeah. Um, take it back. Yeah. I think we've had... The, I've got Deja Vu. We've not talked about this before. That's How long have you had this idea That's a good name made for an app. Deja what? Vu. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, I think you could do that or you could maybe turn it into more of a mobile game. Right. Where... So there's still the 30 second buffer. You've got 30 seconds to press a second button. But what that button does is it puts a lock over the text. It still arrives at your friend with a message saying... Will would like uh, Will doesn't want you to read this message. Oh, okay. So then, and then they've got an option, yeah. And you can and you can monitor their response. You can see whether or not they they. So that's a real pressure play at that point, isn't it? If you got a text from me saying like Charlie would prefer you didn't read this text. I mean, I wouldn't care that you knew that I'd read it because I was definitely going to read it. You can open it fast enough. I mean, I have no. I have uh, like definitely. For the, like you know, around my birthday when the surprise was coming, there was a few people who Facebook messaged me or whatever, and I could tell from the top of it they were about to reveal something that yeah. they didn't know they were. Yeah, like, yeah. was it whatever? And I was very good at just going, "I'm going to dump all that. Yeah. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to read that." So I think that I could do it. When I'm, I don't think I would choose to in that situation. When I'm watching the footy on delay, like you know, I'm, I've recorded the first half and I've just got home, and if, I'll leave the phone, my phone turned over, and when it's the because I'll be half an hour behind. When I know the game's ended, my phone starts blowing up. And so I will put my hand over the front of my phone and read who it's from. And from that, I can determine whether or not, like, 
I should open it or yeah. not? Like, good it's or, not it, that I know... good or bad news? Yeah. Some people come uh, quicker for good like, news, some c- come quicker exactly. for bad news. Like, if it's my mate Nick, who I yeah. go to the football all the time, that could be anything. Right. That could be, what a great Either win, way. what a bad yeah. loss. Either way, he'll contact If you. it's from someone I've never, like, I never hear from, right. who's playing, who barracks for that team, yeah. then I know Obviously, that I don't need to read that. Don't read that. Yeah. <laughs> but you also then know, right? Because yeah, it's true. not like Pavlov's footy game at that point. Anyway, this is a conversation for our other podcast. Um... But yes, I told you that I loved you, but I do love you. <laughs> so, um, okay, here's what I'm going to uh, tell you because we were talking about, um, it's been a big week. Uh, there's been a bunch of funerals and uh, I guess in one of those days where, um, you know, sometimes the, you the way you deal with grief is to, I don't know, like talk around it in a kind of comic or comical way. Yes. So my friend uh, Ben Long, uh, the stink, as people might oh. know him from. Uh, oh, not the Ford Pocket Triple from uh, St Kilda. No, not uh, Michael Long's nephew. But um, he, he sent me this message. We were talking about, uh, you know, obviously the tragic news, and then because uh, he, he's a huge music fan, we used to go to a whole bunch of um, you know music uh, festivals and stuff together, and that's definitely his you know world of music. And then he says this to me: "I had a funny thought about your future funeral before." <laughs> <laughs> Great. Not not saying you'll die anytime soon, but I think it would be a fun idea for it. Ha 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 ha. So I say, well, it could have happened any time from now. Good to be prepared. I'm happy for you to be in charge. No one else has put up their hand, right? So so then he says, you need to pre-record the voiceover for when it starts. Same as your shows. You knew him. You loved him. You couldn't resuscitate him. Brilliant. Fuck it. It was him. Okay. So right now, because I said to him, I would record that so that he could actually use it. So instead of me doing it separately, I'm just going to do it here on the podcast. Okay. All right. You knew him. You loved him. You couldn't resuscitate him. Fuck it. I was him. There you go. All right. So that's good. You've got that uh, for my funeral. God, just deathly silence in yeah. the church. And then he said it would really set the tone. <laughs> so I said, uh, that's good. I'll record it this afternoon, saving it under funeral in my computer so you can find it. <laughs> but now it's on the podcast. Isn't it? that's, it's, it's here. So you have it. Uh, then he says, I was thinking of a confetti cannon off the coffin as back in black place after. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's I like cool. that. I like that. That was your well. entrance music for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. still my in- it's my entrance music, and it will be forever as I do stand up yeah. comedy. Uh, because uh, a, a great hero of mine called Dave Grant, who was a great um, uh, legend of Australian comedy, but also someone who was so kind to me on the way up. Uh, when he died, just as a kind of tribute, so I could always remember him. He used to walk on stage to Back in Black, right. and I started that's doing nice. it. And now that's why I do it all the time. Uh, so I say. Get Foz Dyke to do a banner for me, right? That'd Brilliant. be cool, right? So if we could get Foz... For the pallbearers to run through with a coffin? Well, no. no. <laughs> it's funny, though, that you say that. Okay, I'm thinking more of a backdrop. Yeah, okay, sure. Well, I reckon... <laughs> oh, oh. Hey, 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 settle down. Hey, hey. All right. Well, we'll get uh, Michael to cut out some of that fight. But... Well, this must be the first dog fight in podcasting history, I right? I mean, I have never seen them fight like that, though. That, that was, was full really on. Really full on. I yeah. Don't know what... They're both fine, just in case anyone's worried. Yeah, yeah, no, they're both fine. And they went and sat inside together, although Ramona's decided to come back out again now. We yeah. might just stay in there for a bit. There's a lot of posturing going on. There was. I mean, there was a bottle on the ground and they like a like an <laughs> empty bottle. But jeez, that was a bit too much. That was, I was like, what happened, girls? Your friends. Well, your sisters. sisters. Your sisters. Come on. I guess sisters fight, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, look, it was. I think it was more bark than it was bite. They were definitely... There was a little bit of bite, though. There was. They were definitely yeah. going each other. There was some bark There's and no, some bite. There was no broken Luckily, skin. Luckily, they're French bulldogs, so they mostly, when they try to bite each other, their weird-shaped heads just get <laughs> locked into each other's faces. Yeah. But, yeah, it was a bit much. Winnie's definitely stayed inside. I turned on the heater and she can... Stay inside by the heater and Ramona's come back out here like she did nothing wrong. But Maybe it's the discussion of your funeral. Maybe that's what upset them. I mean, you know what? Maybe that is it. Maybe yeah. I was insane. Maybe too. one of them said, I hope he dies. And the other one's like, no, don't say that. That's our dad. And then they started oh, fighting. God, out of the two. No, I reckon <laughs> they both still want me alive. I do a lot of feeding them. And they both like at night, like when they uh, want to uncomfortably sleep next to someone, they'll both just jam me into a position where I can't move anymore because I have one <laughs> on either side. Yeah. And they snore. So, you know what? They If they, if they think they can do without me... <laughs> good fucking luck. Good luck, guys. 
Uh, all right. So um, so we got to the confetti cannon. We got to the confetti cannon uh, back in black. And I say after oh, that, the I banner. Said, uh, I and could get Foz Dodge to do the backdrop. Yeah. Uh, and then what I, would it be though? Well, I don't know. Some like you know he, when he does my, like for my shows. But don't you normally like give a, him a? No, he just comes up. Oh with right, it. okay. Much like he does with you know the his, three panel strip. The three panel strip. Yeah. <laughs> It's mostly 15 panels, but he told us there might be a one panel one coming. That might be exciting. Really? Yeah. Was that going to be like a uh, Where's Wally type thing? Yeah, it better take Let's three le- months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do in the hardest single panel frame ever. Yeah, I'll try to give him at least... Uh, look, Foz, if you can start working on the one for my funeral now, because, you know, I'd like it to reflect, you know, the sort of the gamut of my life, you know, there in the background. But then I said, this is maybe when I went a little step too far. Yep. I said... Uh, and I want uh, Bont to do the eulogy. <laughs> the younger version of me. Right. I said, I want Bont to do the eulogy, but I said, but Justin can write it. Right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So Justin can write it, but I want Bont to do it. And then he says, yeah, that's good. I'll get Bob Murphy and Easton Wood, plus a pu- couple of your good mates to carry the casket to- into the funeral <laughs> place. I was like, this is starting. I'm hoping I will die. Hey, on, is it, who's died? Will Anderson or Ted Witten? <laughs> and then he says, through a banner with some brilliant wit on it. All oh, right. So there you go. You got Danny McGinley's McGinley getting McGinley a gig. Involved. Maybe you'd get Josh Earl as well, you know, to help him. Uh, dim the lights, pre recorded intro from you, confetti cannon into back in black, bont to read Justin's eulogy, the funeral plans itself. Brilliant. So there you go. Awesome. My wishes are on the public record. You know, my mum actually planned her funeral. As, well, she did it in two parts. She did a. A rough draft, which is literally like with a pen, she had drawn what the cover would look like, you know, the heading. Then inside, she wrote down the breakdown of what would be said and not what would be said, but who would speak and what right. passages she'd like read. And then she did a second draft, which was like where she kind of refined her ideas. I mean, I, I think some people would find that kind of like sad, but I was like, wow. Like, imagine getting to a point where you are so okay with death that you can sit down and put some a lot, of, a lot of thought in how this is going to be the last, you know, the last sort of contact I'm going to have with my loved ones. What, how do I want to go out? What do I want to say? Well, I mean, I think it's that idea of like wanting to throw a party that other people will kind of enjoy. And you know, there's going to be a sadness like, yeah. at the heart of it. So if there's some way that you can, like, I think it's a, a great thing to be able to have that sort of control over going, this is how you know, I want to be remembered and this is like what my last little moment. You're going to remember me for a million different moments. It's yeah. not all going to be about this, but, yeah. you know, to be remembered in a nice well, way. Well, it's is, kind is of great. one of those things too where, like I hate throwing parties for me, like I, having birthday parties or whatever. I just always, you know, I, I just feel weird about it and stuff. But this would be good because I could plan it, but then I don't have to be there to see uh, how disappointed I'm going to be. <laughs> Because that's always my fear is, well, if I have a birthday party, what if no one turns up? Yeah. But- Char- Charlie keeps saying, cater for a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> How do we break it to him? It's okay, he'll be dead. Just cater, exactly. for, cater for 80. But I, don't, I think everyone has done that little bit of fantasy. Or at least everyone's done, what song would I like to have played at my funeral? You know what? I don't know if I have. I don't oh, really, really think. I must admit, until well, today, back in black, which is why so easily, why I so easily just put it in the hands of the first person and offered to plan it. <laughs> Uh, is that I, despite what you've just said, I don't think that I've spent a second of my life really thinking about, about your funeral. my funeral, no. Um, I think about, I mean, I've been to a few, so maybe it's just given me more cause to think about it. But I often think at least on the, I don't really think about who would be there or what would be said or anything like that. But I do think about like what music, you know, uh, would I, you know, what what kind of funeral I'd like it to be. I mean, as someone who grew up Catholic, I don't think I'd want a Catholic funeral. Like I, I figure with music that no matter what I chose, Amy wouldn't think it was quite cool enough and I don't want to ruin her day more. <laughs> and I want to make her feel even madder at me. Well, don't worry. That day. She'll be in prison for your murder. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> she won't hear it. <laughs> Let her choose the music still. Yeah. <laughs> That's my final wish. Yeah. Let her choose the music still. Well, I mean, I've told this story before, but my dad, when he died, his one request was that they played When the Saints Go Marching In, which is, you know, the St. Kilda theme song, uh, club song, obviously. And uh, they, they, I think he missed a tiny bit of detail, which, you know, w- proved to be important on the day, which was he wanted the jaunty New Orleans, like the club song. But whoever got the memo was like, oh, it's a funeral. We don't right. want to play a jaunty. So they played this really mournful, slow, dun, 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 boom, dun, 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 like a funeral march. And it's like, I, 
don't think that was his intention. He didn't say, hey, take this song that's brought me so much joy in my life and make it really morose. I don't want to mix our two podcasts too much. There's a reason we have two separate ones, but that would be great if the Saints played that up version after losses. <laughs> They play the winner's song. And they just and have to the trudge. Have to trudge off the ground to this funereal version of their song. Well, I guess, you know, that was probably in the days before you could really pull up any song on Spotify. So, How, Would you like speakers at your funeral? Um, yeah. I mean, I think the one thing I would want... I, I've been, The best funeral I've ever been to was a friend of... Um, family friends. We sort of... Big families where we sort of grew up in the same neighborhood. And... Uh, Lots of kids. Father died quite suddenly. He was one of the, one of those stories you hear about, which is like oh, he was super fit, didn't drink, didn't smoke, died on a treadmill in his mid fifties, had a heart attack. And uh, I remember going to that funeral, being really nervous about going in because you know he's the patriarch of this massive fucking family, and it was so sudden, and uh, it was one of the most enjoyable, entertaining events i've been to like a few of his kids are musicians and stuff so they opened the funeral with a song like four of them like jackson five up there with like synchronized moves and singing and then they had a kind of open um uh, i guess like an open invitation for eulogies which was like no one is appointed as a speaker but if you have something you'd like to come up and say about mark come up and say it and so there was they had uh if you will an open mark night <laughs> yes they did <laughs> With less tears. It was weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember, and then I remember like afterwards just being like, wow, that was fantastic. There was no, I mean, there's obviously tears and stuff, but the tears were just like, it was, it was joyful. And then even the wake afterwards, I remember going to the wake and seeing um, one of his sons, you know, who's around about my age and sharing my condolences. And, you know, he was just, he just was, the family wanted to celebrate him. I know it's a cliche about, you know, I don't want people crying, I want people celebrating, but it's a, a lot harder in action. Like, you know, to actually, to actually go, well, you know, how do we, where, how do we celebrate, you know, the good things about this person or the good things in the relationship? I, I, if I can have a request, I would love that people only celebrate the good things. <laughs> I do not feel like that is a time I'm reflecting on any of the negative <laughs> qualities that I've brought to the table. I've spent enough time during my life trying to examine and like, you know, write the negative aspects of my personality. I feel mm. like on that day, just give me a day off from that where you guys can just say nice things. I think though that it, the, when it's in tragic or unexpected circumstances, I think it is hard because we're all looking for, for reasons. Like we're all looking for a justification of why. But at happened. the age we're at now, I understand that like, you know, uh, like, I could live another amount, the same amount of time as I have lived. But as our earlier discussion told us, like we also in that zone where people just sometimes just die. And did you see that report that came out this week that like over the latest uh, studies have done over half of deaths recorded have no obvious cause. Right. People just die. Die for who knows why. Yeah. So there's any chance that I could die or any of us could die for who knows why at any fucking stage. So, Any of us could die for who knows why. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're launching a new band, Charlie yeah. and I. <laughs> Tofop is now a band. Seven years in. Tofop goes on tour. Can you guys play? No. No. We, we reworked the lyrics to Tofog, Russell Crowe's songs. <laughs> but Using quotes from Tofop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tofop and Tofog that would mean... together at last. Can you imagine oh, the... if Russell Crowe heard about this and was like, you know, that's funny. Well, finally, I've looked for a way yeah. where we could incorporate the two. We're going to get Tofog back together. But what we want you to do is Russell on the night is going to sing... Chris Cornell style, where he's saying the lyrics to one over U2's oh, one. Sing he's going to sing of episodes of Tofop. Amazing. Russell Crowe sings episodes of Tofop with Tofog. <laughs> that would be incredible. Or do you reckon he would, like if we did a big live show, do you reckon Tofog could be the house band? So we could have Russell as band leader, like we could throw to him and then they could also like play us into, play us into guests and segments and stuff like that. How about if we got our own Tonight Show yes. based around this? Like some channel comes along. like some And new... says, we want to lose all our money. 
Sometimes channels do that. Yeah, so it's right. one of those booms. That's what we're banking on. <laughs> we're banking is it on. Channel 10 want to go into receivership? Well, they're about to go into receivership and they're like, oh, let's just roll the dice. <laughs> that sounds like a premise for an Adam Sandler film. Yeah, we've heard podcasting's a thing. What about if we just put that on TV? Hmm. I mean, kind of they do do that in, like on sports channels and stuff now. They'll just put the sports radio show also on the TV at the yeah, same time. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine they go, we'd like to build a Tonight Show around... Like this show. So basically, you're just going to do TOEFOP, but we'll yeah. gonna have a couple of guests and there'll be a band at the end and there'll be like house music. We'll go to commercials, right? Yeah. Like, we can get you TOEFOP, Russell Crowe's band. He can't play with them all the time. Yeah. Like, he'll only do like. Oh, so he won't be permanent member? No, because I mean, floating... I don't think we can get him. But oh, I you think, think get... Russell Crowe's got other things to do? <laughs> you I think got... besides do our fake talk show for I our feel fake like radio we can show? Get him, like, for the first. Ooh. Well, maybe Russell Crowe buys the network. Ah, good. This is how. Yes. And he's looking for. Russell Crowe content. I guess that's so right. How about, okay, so Russell Crowe. Because he's Crow, basically franchising his brand, which was 30 odd foot of blank. Right. 30 odd foot of grunt or s- grunt? Grunts. Uh, grunt. Singular. Grunt. 30 odd 30 foot, foot of grunt? Whatever. So, and then we're, we know by now. <laughs> we're 30 odd foot of pod. So we're just 30 odd Pods? foot, 30 odd. F- <laughs> which is James Pods Yadsley's <laughs> podcast. Again, referring to you guys. Forget it. You guys should listen to that one if you like football. I, I okay, so um, <laughs> what the fuck? We so we've got our tonight show. Okay. Russell Crowe's out. So Russell Crowe, here's what happens. Russell Crowe buys Channel Ten. Yeah, because Channel Ten in Australia at the moment is losing heaps of money. The value of it's like completely low. And Russell Crowe decides I'm going to sweep in because here's the thing: I have all these movies and stuff. I make a lot of my money off the royalties of when these movies get sold and stuff. What if I become like we just my have own a, distributor? We and we have our own channel, yeah. and it's just like Russell Russ, Crowe twenty four seven, twenty four seven. Yeah, go Russ, go. Yeah, every single part of the day, and so like they would discuss all these latest projects. is a great way for him to publicize things, but also there's Russell themed. Does he call it like shows. Russ flicks? So that's not bad. Okay, so he buys a streaming service yeah. called Russ Flicks, <laughs> and it's mostly his stuff. Yeah, but it's also like, you know, the place where it's Russell-inspired things and we get a gig on that. Yeah, that'd be get, awesome. Yeah, yeah, because they would... Because I reckon the other you members know what? of Tofog I, I, look, I, I, aren't as busy as Russell. I don't want to get all, like, dollars and cents about it, but I don't think... Like, if Russ Flicks takes off, yeah. they're not going to be putting... Uh, like a live talk show on Rustflix, but you go to the Rustflix website, there would be digital content. Uh, yeah. I think we would be the talk show on the website, kind of like Nerdist do with 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 their stuff, I, like a seven minute talk show. As I can always rely on you to do with this podcast, Charlie, you've lowered our expectations. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Like you must oh, okay. be amazing. So you're you going to be amazing so at a pitch meeting. <laughs> so you're going to tell you're like someone's like right. we'd like to give you fifteen million million dollars for a movie, and you're like, no, you'd like to give me fifteen dollars for a hat. I'm being a realist. So you're holding out for Russell to buy his own streaming service. I'm not holding out for it. I'm just putting it out there that that might be a cool idea. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. Forget what I said. Because these big stars, once they get but to the there are no. To- what I'm trying to say is, there's it's, no. Well, you know what? There Jay- are no live talk shows on mate, streaming services. Jay Z has like title or whatever. Hey. So why Jay Z? You know, has title. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that is part of the problem with Right. About, unfortunately. But like what, Spotify or whatever. Okay. So there's one of those music services that is called Tidal and it's Jay-Z's one, right? Right. So why couldn't like Russell Crowe have his own version of like a, you know, a, like a streaming network? He could. Yeah. But if it, Jay-Z but can, Russell Crowe can. We said it would be all Russell stuff. I thought what were... In the, in no, it's initially all Russell stuff okay. and then it's Russell related stuff and then eventually they'll just have to... Buy more content. Well, it'll just be maybe it's like Russell related still, so you can show Denzel movies because they did a movie together. Sure. So are we compromised? But your starting point is always Russell. You have to go through Russell to get to anything else. Are we compromised in any way by Russell buying the show? Russell gives us full creative control. Okay. All right. And he and he can and he nominates when he appears and and how long? Like if he wants to play a new eleven minute song he's written, he gets to do that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's aware that like we will then. Make fun of that 11 minute song. Why would we? He's amazing. Hang on, don't start sucking up to him already. This thing is. Well, you want to get this deal across this li- the deal across the line when you're not even going to like play Russell's ball. A, yeah, but you know what, mate? Like, I don't want to just turn this into an episode of Seinfeld, but <laughs> we've we've got to act like we're a bit cool, right? Like, yeah, we've got okay. to act like we don't want it. Can't all be Russell's, thing, yeah, right? Totally. Oh yeah, go and find yourself another Russell Crowe theme podcast that is appropriate for this. <laughs> See, we're in actually quite a strong negotiating. Yeah, I didn't think we cornered the market. We have cornered the market in Russell Crowe vaguely themed, vaguely themed podcasts. 
<laughs> Name me another one. If that category was on iTunes, we'd be number one everywhere. Crying about? Crying about. That is a good podcast. Actually. Big, shout out. Big yeah. shout out to the guys at Crying About. Yeah, Martin Crow, who's also, I think he's Russell Crowe's cousin. It's about all crows. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah. Martin Crow and Russell Crowe are cousins. Are they really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And you're the, what, what other famous crows are there? Um, the one from The Raven. No, it was Sam Crow, the, the, the gang the, <laughs> from Sons of Anarchy. Wow, yeah, we're Crow. stretching. Yeah. All related. Russell Crowe and Sam Crowe. First cousins. It's really big and dangerous Christmas. Um, I, uh, I'm just going to pause for a second because... Okay. Uh, Dogs are fighting again? No, the do- you know what? Is Ramona still here? Yeah, Ramona's yeah, here. Yeah, okay. A, she looks, she looks, she separated. looks like she's regretted. That's okay. She's I'm regretted it. Okay, we're back. We're we've, back. We've had quite a substantial break, though. Yeah, it's funny. We've done two podcasts this week. Uh, two Guys, One Cup, we recorded three days ago. And you had two deliveries arrive yeah. mid-podcast? Mid-podcast. Today, you had another appointment arrive mid-podcast. I had a valuer coming to value the house. Oh, yeah. And you were being very helpful by yeah. hiding anything he shouldn't say. <laughs> and also then commenting on how uh, yeah. valuable my inflatable pool toys might be <laughs> to add value to the house i really the only thing i hid in here was seasons one through ten of smallville because i'm like that guy will say that and go this dude's a fucking psychopath this will take the value of the house down a little <laughs> who has all 10 seasons of smallville Are there I, 10 i mean yeah oh. I, I mean and yes i do have them all do um, you really yeah wow okay well, i was joking I mean, but yeah, yeah i think i watched them all on dvd i, I reckon that's like pre even like you kept DVDs internet. alive for two years longer than they were going to be. I could open my own DVD shop. I've got some oh, pretty yeah, good DVDs heaps. here and yeah, I've got heaps do. and there's actually heaps. I think I have some of your DVDs at my place. Yeah, we should have like a Tofu pop-up DVD shop. Oh, that's a great That'd idea. That'd be a good way to fund the... And we could sign them. Oh, you know what we should do? We just buy DVDs. All right, this is what we'll do. Maybe next week or something. You just randomly close your eyes and grab 10 DVDs off the shelf. I'll do the same. We'll read what they are on air and then like people can guess... Do you think it belongs to Charlie or Will? Oh, okay. So it's a How Will Do You Know Charlie? Yeah, but DVD, about edition. DVD edition. Yeah, yeah. So well, maybe five. Probably probably 10 each is too many. We'll bring five DVDs and just grab them randomly. Right, five each. I'll read my five. You read we your... We read, four. we talk about them. We don't reveal whose they are. Yes. Right, we mix them up together. Yes, that's great. And we don't reveal who they are. And then the first person yeah. who gets all the correct answers on the Facebook page after the episode... They get the DVDs. Yeah. And, and as a prize pack. And it could happen. That's pretty good. It could happen that because it's random that we both select the same DVD, which oh. makes it more interesting. Yeah. Don't you reckon? Well, that's good. And that's, if you that's pick, one you can lock in. If though. you pick one that is one we both have, that's like a bonus. Yeah, that's a bonus. Oh, yeah. wouldn't everybody? Because oh, we'll only do one. Yeah. Right. But then they'll know because we'll only do nine. Oh, no. Okay. So we'll grab the five if there's more than one. If, we if have there's like, a crossover. If there's like three Adam Sandler films yeah. all the same, we'll have to redraw. So okay. I, we can have one yeah, in common. Yeah, because we're going to be doing it here anyway. I'm, hey, what I'm like saying, hundreds of DVDs. All right, are we show. saying that there'll be, there will be one film that we both have? No. So it's just going to be random. Let's do this as an ongoing thing. If it, like if people like it the first time, then maybe we could do it like occasionally. We could do it, and then I got to eventually get rid of all these fucking DVDs. <laughs> I don't want to throw them out, but they have no value. But they might have value in this sense. I keep receiving DVDs to this day. I haven't bought. Oh, me too. I haven't bought a DVD, but um, Gemma yeah, they get sent to you. Well, Gemma's in the DGA. Yeah. So every Oscar season, she gets sent all the films that are, are, are trying to vie for an Oscar nomination. Yeah, but they're not official copies. They're not for reason. No, 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 no. They're the ones that you see when you uh, torrent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, see. the only other way to see them will is to torrent. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we're going to set up our own torrent service. Essentially. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, oh, by the way, someone can someone remind us about that because uh, we, we will forget. But yeah, let's, I've that, forgotten that, that's the a good things idea. that we've said in the first part of this fucking episode. I've been doing a lot of adult things uh, recently because I'm not around the house that often, and it's been a period of time where I've been around the house and I've had some time to get things done. So that's why there's so many appointments and so many things being dropped off and so many people coming around. I'm trying to fix up my house a bit and do some adult responsibility things. Yeah. You have been very domestic. Yeah. yeah. I've been trying, I've been cooking. Yes. Quite a lot. Cooking twice. Yeah. I think that's the most I've seen you cook in the entire time of knowing you. I mean, that might be right. I've had a in real In terms run. of consecutive visits, you've been cooking both times. You're I don't not think talking I... into the microphone now. You're on the oh, side shit, of it. Sorry. I think you turned it around. That's okay. I've been talking loud. But I... Up until then, it was fine. But then you really moved away. I don't think I... I've seen you cook, but it's more like a sighting of a shooting Prepare. star. Oh, okay, yeah. Sure. Like, it happens every now and I then. I do a lot of preparing. I can prepare things. Yeah, but I don't see that, man. 
I don't no, see no, no. pairing. Well, also, in this household, it's fair to say that out of the two of us, Amy is the much superior Oh, my God. Cook. Amy is one of the best cooks yeah, I know. Yeah, she's a really good cook. In the world. And she does not really admire her own cooking, but I think she's a really great cook. And so... Yeah. We just go to the skill set there. You know, it's not like some sort of male, female locked into like, yeah, that sort of thing. She just like often will cook if it's the choice between the two of us because she's better at it than yeah. I am. But she's been working and getting home late. And I thought it was a nice thing that I would like, you know, make sure that she had like a, a meal on the table mm. from a hard worker when they come home. Yeah. You know, so I've been cleaning up the house and sort of sorting that out. And it, yeah, I went and bought a washing machine the other day. I've been very domestic. Yeah. And I've been trying to cook. I've had some... Here's what I would say. So here's what I've made in the last like week. These are the meals that I've made. And I'll finish with the one I did first, but it was the least successful. So I'll finish with that. Uh, so the first one was, uh, so the, the second one, which was, was successful, I made this like, uh, it was a farro soup, farro and lentil soup. Yeah. It was like a winter soup. It tasted yeah. really meaty, but it was like a vegetarian dish, obviously. Yeah. And me soup, a farro soup. A Mia Farrow soup, yeah. yeah. It made some inappropriate allegations about Woody Allen, but yeah. it was delicious. You served it with a wooden spoon. <laughs> yeah. Here's your Woody to dip into your Mia <laughs> Farrow. I served it with a Woody spoon. <laughs> it's all themed. Uh, and then I had the plant skip. Uh, <laughs> and Jesus then the Harris. Christ. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the Farrow soup, very successful. Made some um, garlic and cheese croutons. Uh, to go with it, yeah, I uh, saw that part. Yeah, that was that was that was I I would say big tick to that. That but you know soup, if you're gonna go with something pretty basic, you're basically just blending shit up, just chopping stuff up and blending shit up. I mean, eventually, there's no what, skill. What you're saying is, well, there's some skill in that. I would say, really, but, but not heaps. No, because ultimately, like you, you're just putting things in a blender and serving it in a big hot. There's well, no pre- there's no presentation. This was one skills. I didn't even have to put in a blender. I didn't even have to blend this soup. So like it's even pre-blender. It was all in one big pot. I had to chop things up. I had to put them in a pot. Yeah. I had to, at the end of it, um, uh, swirl like some... Oh, no, I made a... So I made a, a creme fraiche a Greek yogurt. Creme fraiche. Um, uh, lemon zest sort of like topping for the farro soup. And I made the garlic crouton. So there was a little bit of yeah. preparation work, you know. Yeah. Sorry, just to pause. You know, at the start of the show, we're talking about like the inevitability of death and, you know, how we choose to distract ourselves. <laughs> I just, I got to say, Will, like, you're still going to die. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can make all the creme fraiche you want and cauliflower soup and whatever. Well, it's funny you say cauliflower soup because two days later I did indeed make cauliflower soup. That one had to go in the blender. So I felt like that was an increased degree of difficulty. What? It's the easier, easiest part. I make soup every week. Every week, motherfucker. Yeah, okay. But well, I've like made it twice but, uh, in but, like, my life. No, but you make your the, the meals you make are more finesse. Because I, when Gemma and I first got together, I'd say she also did the bulk of the cooking for similar reasons. She was just better at it. And then there was a shift. I think it was actually when I just started getting healthy. Right. I Because there were certain things I certain things you couldn't eat. So I didn't, you I didn't want to eat. take charge. 100%. And then she liked the way I cooked. And then I got more interested in it. Well, this was part of my thinking as well because. Amy has to put up with the fact that I'm vegetarian and she's not. So yeah. most of the time she eats vegetarian food. But eventually, because she's not the one who's vegetarian, she runs out of inspiration of like thinking what would be a vegetarian food. Whereas like my endeavor during my week of cooking was to prepare delicious and different vegetarian foods that yeah. might like we could add back in because I'm the one bringing it to the table. Yeah, it's like, you know, if you're like a, an au pair or a nanny or something, like you love the kid. Right. But it's someone else's fucking kid. It's someone kid. else's kid. <laughs> I fucked your husband. Oh, hang on. What? What? <laughs> hang on. <laughs> um, so uh, I made a wild rice casserole one day, wild mush- rice and mushroom casserole. But I think I put it in the wrong size dish because I think it was meant to be like thicker and mine came out a bit more like a sort of slice. Yeah. So it tasted really good, but it was like presentation wise, it was a bit of a fail. How adventurous... Like, of the recipes you're doing out of a book, are there any that you've got memorized now that you can just make? The one I made last night, which I think was the most successful of all of them, which was this, like, summer zucchini chili linguine. I could make that now without having to yeah. go to the book now. And isn't that the best part? Because that's when you start, like, that's when you can, you've taken the training wheels off and you're pedaling down the street and you're like, let's see if I can pull a wheelie here. You know, you're well, like, oh, a bit of lemon juice in there, a bit of salt. 
It's funny you say that because there was some leftover linguine yes. from last night. And then this morning I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to make my son some sort of breakfast pasta thing. And so I got some eggs and I got some mushrooms and I tossed in the linguine. And I was like, I'm a master chef. <laughs> it's, it's like gardening. I've been thinking about gardening a lot because I live in an apartment now. I have no You're garden. You're still going to die. Huh? You're still going to die. Exactly. That's, like I, re- I was like, because... When I was a kid, I used to garden with my parents and like a way we'd get pocket money is we'd have to take a little, uh, like a fork into the front yard and pull weeds out of the front lawn. So if you got like, mum would give you five cents a weed or whatever. But I used to like just the repetitive kind of nature of just being out in nature and just like doing something in nature. And then I was like, wow, I haven't had that feeling in fucking 30 years. And so I was like, I should like get a little garden. I should see if I can put a garden on the rooftop, just like some herbs and plants and stuff. And then I was like, you're still going to die. <laughs> you realized. should do that though, because I, like, as I've been cooking this week, I've really been going, oh, it'd be great to be able to go out in the garden and get fresh stuff. I I can't do that here. The dogs are just going to dig that up. So if you could just do that on your roof. Well, my, I can sell it to I'll you. Come, yeah, you <laughs> we can, start out when green you come grocer. Over for the podcast, you can bring like a box of fresh produce as like a little farm to podcast <laughs> operation. <laughs> roof to podcast. We've been looking for a sponsor. Maybe it's Whole Foods. Yeah. Well, no, but Charlie's Foods. Yeah. Your foods, our foods. <laughs> we'll have recipes at the end. We'll cash in on the MasterChef, guys. Um, We're getting older, aren't we? So, well, the other the, the other thing I, I tried to make, the most unsuccessful one was um, I decided I would try to make uh, homemade sushi. Oh, yeah. I saw the initial stages of that. Yeah. And you said to me as I left, I said, oh, God, that's impressive. And you're like, it's uh, quite simple, actually. Yeah. So I spoke too soon. Because <laughs> I'd had a trial run the day before yeah. and it had kind of... It seemed to be quite simple, but it turns out it's one of those things that perhaps you can just stumble your way into getting right the first time and then the second time it turns out that you've you've learnt no lessons. (laughs) Um, So firstly, you need a sharp knife. Turns out I didn't have one of those things. Uh, It's really hard to guess what temperature oil is. That's what I discovered Uh, because I was going to temper some vegetables and you've got to heat it to 170 degrees. So that not It turns out... Well, it turns out I don't know if that's boiling or not. I just kind Hang of on, but 100 degrees, chuck... is, 100 degrees is boiling. Oh, yeah, so it's more. See, I didn't even think it through that far. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I don't really know. You've just got the oil on the floor and you're just like slapping the tempura on it. You're like, what's going on? Why is it not cooking? You've got to put it uh, on the oven, Will. Oh, Will, you're not, you know, you're not meant to get a massage. <laughs> Hang on, put the oil away. So they told you... You had to heat it to a specific temperature, the oil. Yeah, the oil but in like a, a wok or a, in, have you got a deep well, fryer? Just in a, like, well, you know, I was just using a large saucepan, but okay. like one of those big sort of... So how would they expect anyone? I mean, are people... Well, you'd have like a... Thermometer? A thermometer, I guess. Look, I am no master chef. A kitchen th- but, thermometer. But the people... Uh, like, oh, this I is going to sound so ignorant. I think if the, you need to know the exact like heat of something... Well, that's what I'm saying though. Then, is like, would most, I, would most people you know have a thermometer in their kitchen? Well, I guess people who cook do. Well, well because here's the thing, Charlie. But, he, I now want a thermometer in my kitchen. So uh, I guess if... So industry. next time I can make like... No, no, fuck you. It's like I a printer. Yeah, the printer's cheap. The fucking ink's expensive. Yeah. Thermometers are a thousand dollars each. The recipe book cost me thirty five dollars, but the amount of equipment I've had to buy to fucking make these recipes. Yeah, you feel very grown up when you make one of those. Per- I bu- I bought my first kind of like, you know, whatever. What do you call it? Like a, a cooking set, like pots and pans. Oh yeah, okay, and, sure. And because uh, what I found um, with the now that I'm cooking more is I really like steaming vegetables, a healthy way, keep the flavor, keep them, you know, just that crispy, close to close to raw thing. But I didn't have like a proper steamer. And so when I bought this like full um, kit, the one thing I was really obsessed with was this steamer. And it's because that's how I do all my vegetables. But then I started looking at the four or five other pots or pans that I wasn't actually using and being like, all right, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Maybe I can grill a zucchini. Maybe I can do something in the grill. And it's like, oh, that's how they fucking get you in. (laughs) It's like the extras you need. You know, it's interesting though, because I would describe... So here's when I first got interested in cooking again, I think it was when I moved to America. I reckon up until that point, I hadn't done much cooking at all, but it's, I suddenly had my own apartment and I had to go and get like some pots and pans and stuff like that. So you suddenly then feel the need to justify the fact that you went and bought pots and pans. You don't have it. a steamer. I noticed in your apartment. No, no, no. Well, this is what I was about to say to you. I would say I'd describe my cooking style as I love cooking with just like very few 
bits and bobs. Yeah. Like I really love something you can make with like, you know, a few pots and pans and like a wooden spoon and like old school cooking. Yeah. Like I like the fact that I don't have a whisk, anything that you can whisk with a fork. Yeah, like, that's I, know, I noticed of, that as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All the things that I use. Yeah. I use a whisk every morning no, and I'm, I steam every night. Yeah. And no, the I'm, two things I need, you didn't have. And a fucking thermometer. I don't think I do it. No, I you don't. Of it, no. But, no well, you, you, you did. You, you had the bare minimum yeah. of cooking implements. It was like... But it, it, if the you stuff were, you need to get pretty much if, all yeah, your jobs done. It, that's right. If, you, uh, if, you're, you know, if you're MacGyver and you need to make a meal, you've got the, be- you've got the Swiss Army knife of cooking utensils yeah. in the place. I, you can I, I fry, like you can boil. Three different size pots. An oven, a good oven. Real like, good, real really good, good oven. oven. But that yeah. came with the apartment. And, a great, and a great fucking toaster. You got a really good toaster. I bought that. That was I was <laughs> responsible for yeah. that. Person. That toaster is like a sexy kind of. It's like a Lamborghini toaster. It's like I'll tell you something interesting about America and Australia is like we they do don't not, like toast. We do not. Well, they do not like toast. Yeah. They don't get what toast is. No. It's like warm bread. Yeah, but and tea. Oh God, can we talk about the tea situation? Sure, in the US? let's go. Like, I mean, I've got to go back there, and I, I want to get let through customs. And nowadays, they probably no. You just say so you're part of the tea party. You're oh, talking okay, about yeah. tea, so yeah, you'll tea. be fine. Yeah, <laughs> we're tea baggers. Yeah, it, I, I, the, there's a like. Look, here's the thing with tea: you put tea in water, you let it diffuse to about three minutes, and then you add milk. If you actually got milk, which would be more from the night your daughter like, unless you breakfast. already have pre-made tea. Yeah, like so, you can add the milk first if the tea is pre-made, but you can't add the milk first if you're putting the the bag tea bag in. There. in yeah, yep. but you often wouldn't get. By the way, there are still going to be uh, truthers, tea truthers, <laughs> double tea truthers, <laughs> yeah, uh, tea truthers, tea bag of tea truthers, yeah, uh, out there who will have other methods. It's something that I talk to uh, flight attendants oh, about really? quite a lot, and I'll, they talk about the tea is very various specific. ways that people like their tea served, and but they're very specific. Don't you about find it. it uncouth to have like? milk and tea in with the bag it's kind with of the gross. bag sure gross. but if you have like tea already prepared in a teapot yeah and i actually quite like the idea of you like, put milk in put, first well i'm not saying that i do do that but on the occasions where it's happened or somebody's gone this is the right way to do it i'm like i'm fine either way just give us a cup of fucking tea to be honest but do you have sugar i do not have sugar in my tea i have honey uh in the morning and really? then i don't have honey for the rest of the day but i have honey in the morning and I have sugar in my coffee. It's too... Yeah, I'm not... I, I like... I well, because you're living some Spartan existence. No, you don't, you don't <laughs> no, I do. No, I just don't... I don't like sweet tea. I find it sickly. I like a kind of good, dry... In the morning... Yeah. I like a, a sweeter beverage. But I'm having like... I'll have I'll have it with like fruit or something. And you're getting the sugar from the fruit. Yeah. Well, see, I'm not doing that. Okay. I'm never eating fruit. <laughs> fruit can get fucked. Fuck I fruit. hate fruit. Do you really? Yeah. All well, of apart it. from the fruits who pretend they're not fruits. I like... Tomatoes. Uh, c- cucumber, tomato. Cucumber's a fruit? Yeah. Holy Seed. shit. Are we, is this a Tofob exclusive? No. <laughs> In no way is it a Tofob exclusive. Cucumbers, Cucumber, um, know, the, tomato, but the example people, and avocados. People always bring up the tomato one. That's like, yeah. oh, the tomato's a fruit. Yeah. Avocado but, and cucumber. Cu- well, avocado I could have guessed, yeah. but cucumber, it's the seed factor, right? Yeah, it's the seed factor. Yep. Cucumber is a... And they're my three favourite... You never hear anyone talk about... they're actually fruits. You never hear anyone talk about, like, uh, cucumber as a fruit. Tomato, you hear? I'd be surprised. Well, I'm going to Google that to see if that's true now. Because oh, like, shit. Where did you hear well, it, do you think? Well, I don't know. Where, did you just decide? You <laughs> Will has decided to reclassify cucumbers. Often, often I decide. Cucumber, fruit or vegetable? At least there's, well, there's a, you know, good question up here. We can answer it. So... <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought this is where we would get to? But here we are. Uh, all right. Wait, so wait, 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 cucumber, wait. fruit, or vegetable? Just hold on one second. Okay. Cucumber, fruit, or a vegetable? The question is: Is cucumber a fruit or a vegetable? Is a common one. It's a common question, Charlie, <laughs> who's never heard it before. According to this, is website. it really a common question? According to w- is that is that got a is that got a citation? According to www.tommies.nl. Oh, you're not even on Wikipedia. <laughs> no, but this is a very official-looking site. Okay. Um, uh, at Tommy's, we chiefly look at the answer to this question from a health perspective. Oh no, hang on. Oh, a health perspective. No, we don't want to fucking know. Oh no, 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 no. no. We want to know like strictly no, by have, the letter. Got, that's the top. By the letter of the law. Yeah. All right. Uh, cucumber. Now we've gone to Wikipedia. Okay, great. Cucumber. Uh, Cucumus sativus is a widely cultivated plant in the gourd family. It's a gourd. 
actually. What does that mean? It's go- what's from Asterix. That's what he carried around. <laughs> his, his magic, magic potion. potion <laughs> and uh, a cucumber. That uh, reading those comics all wrong. A gourd. Hang on. If I told you suck some magic potion out of my cucumber. You know when you click on something hoping you'll find an answer and the answer makes it so much more complicated than what you were hoping? <laughs> That's this A episode. gourd is a plant of the family curcubitaceae. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly curcubita and legendaria. This is part of the ongoing Tofop theme of Will having Tofop to pronounce words. <laughs> words. Or the fruit of the two genera of big, big oh, nonacea. Christentia and Amphitechna. <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, so they're fruit. It doesn't actually. It said bonded of two on. fruit. <laughs> I well, just gave it the I just gave it the Game of Thrones spin in. <laughs> bonded by two fruit. Bonded by fruit. The cucumbus maximus. It's a creeping vine. So that doesn't really say either. Well, grapes grow on a vine. A grapes fruit. Oh yeah, grapes are fruit. Uh, it's a creeping vine that bears cumcu cumcumiform fruits. Fruits. Fruits, okay. That are used as vegetables. Look, so there you go. They're fruits used as vegetables. I'm not disputing it's a fruit, but I'm disputing the idea that everyone knows cucumber is a fruit. Well, I mean, it turns out it like is. Like when though. you order... I mean, isn't there... Oh, I was going to say, isn't there a cucumber salad? But I guess there's watermelon salad as well. Anything can be a salad, Will. Don't discriminate. <laughs> Could you get a carrot salad? If you are, if you yeah, there is a carrot salad. They do like is a Middle really? Eastern carrot and like all a right. Let's pick a carrot and sultana. Let's pick thing. a vegetable or fruit that you couldn't possibly get a salad from. Papaya salad, no, that, no, they no, have that. that. Um, potato, no shit, that's a famous potato one. salad. Yeah, sweet potato salad, that's easy. Uh, uh, avocado ca- salad, that capsicum was, oh, well, salad, capsicum salad, banana salad. Who's uh, getting a banana salad? I mean, well, no, that, the banana salad isn't that like where well, you put some ice cream and some chocolate. <laughs> That's a banana <laughs> split, a banana, dude. Well, that doesn't count. Or banana okay. salad. Will Will can't understand why he's not losing weight. He keeps saying he's eating banana salad. Here we go. The following are oh, banana bread. That's my. Uh, the following are technically fruits. Um, <laughs> Oh, God, is this not Brian Taylor's side, is it? Because we may get some very different answers. The following are technically fruits avocado. Yep. Cucumbers. Got it. Tomatoes. Yeah. But right. there are some others. Oh, shit. So, here the we lesser go. known fruits. Yeah, exactly. So, um, all right. Uh, beans, actually, fruits. Beans, beans, and musical fruit. The yeah. more you eat, the oh. more you toot. Oh, there you go. It's the in more the you song. toot, the better you feel. You know what? It was in the song the whole time. We so, let's have baked beans for every meal. Who would have known that that ditty was so truthful? Truthful. They're trying correct. to fucking that's it, educate well, people. They're trying to let people know, and everyone's like, oh, it's a song about farts. It's no, like, no. It's, it's a song about-, about the fact that beans are fruit. <laughs> A musical fruit. Yeah, this guy's come in and he didn't even get... Like, he's like, no, that's not what my song's about. <laughs> yeah. Why is everyone... He's mad to this day. I was just trying to say, if you want the energy to play your yeah. trumpet really right. well, you should eat beans. Oh. The, that are a fruit. Yeah, exactly. The musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you can toot. toot. As in your trumpet. Your trumpet. Oh, you're not talking about farting. No. No. No, I meant... Is that not clear? Right. There's actually no mention of farting in the song. I need to point that out. Well, you just beans, sort of said... Beans, beans... The musical fruit. So my first thing is that I'm trying to encourage knowledge of science that beans are indeed a fruit and I'm mm. also in trying to encourage knowledge of music. Okay, sure. They are the musical fruit. We got that part, yeah. The more you eat, yep. the more you toot. Fart. The simple process of taking carbohydrates into your body means that you will have energy to be able to play your trumpet or your so, recorder or your whistle or anything that toots for longer. So you, um, when you say... You know, you're, you're trying. You're talking like a rusty trombone or something. No, I'm talking about an actual like. You know, I mean, it could be a clarinet. You can include. So it beans, a beans, and musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. Is not about farting. No, it's about music. The the more you eat, the better you feel. So Wh- eat. Why didn't you write that? Baked beans for every meal. It's all there in the song, mate. Uh, we owe, people just don't really sing the second. We owe you a, a huge apology. Sorry, the, is, the memo's already gone out to really, every primary school in Australia and. Uh, uh pea pods. <laughs> Corn kernels. Fruit. Fruit. Fuck off. It's a grain. <laughs> Corn kernels. Apparently fruits. Dispute that. Grains and nuts. Are all fruit. So a wheat bix is a piece of fruit, is it? Shut up, Wikipedia. Is it Wikipedia? Olives, peppers, pumpkins. Squash. Olives are not fruit. <laughs> Pumpkin, I'll 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 also see that. Squash, sunflower seeds, and tomatoes. 
Sun, hang on, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Sunflower seeds are fruit. How can they be fruit? Listen to what you're saying. I, I mean, I understand. You're going to start some fucking InfoWars style show from your from your office where you're saying seeds of fruit. Tomato, cucumber, here's another side. Tomato, cucumber, courgette, which is like zucchini. So okay. I actually made myself a fruit pasta last night, it turns out. Avocado, peppers. Okay, so capsicum. capsicum. They are fruit. Um, yeah, there you go. Lots of... That's bullshit. Anyway. So what's happened there? Can we just have clearer... No, who cares? You know what it is? It's fluid. You are you are f- oh, yeah. fruit and vegetable fluid. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Why do you have to be defined in binary? You have to be a fruit or a vegetable. Can you not be born a fruit, but like want to hang out well, and like I, appear I, like a vegetable? I That's guess... Fine. I guess You can do that, of course. I, I, but you can't dispute Scare the fact that people. people get yeah scared about... They think they're ordering like, you know, like a vegetable salad and they get like, you know, a bunch of... Yeah, bananas. But, don't, but don't be so fruit phobic. No, but I can understand it's not what you were expecting. I'm not saying that like well, you educate, one educate wrong. Educate yourself better. It's not the it's not the fruit or vegetables responsibility to educate you on something yeah, that you can point. educate yourself on. But you can understand the why out there. I found it pretty quickly. I mean, if you want it, yeah, it's there. How about you do some work? All right. Not you personally. I'm okay. just the person in this. <laughs> imaginary bigot? In this, <laughs> yeah. How about you, imaginary bigot? What about you, straw man? <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> wow, that's like the, you're doing the reverse straw man. I've never heard someone on the left <laughs> create a straw man argument. It's because the right have already created the left straw man and brought Do them to Do you want to, to explain life. what the straw man is? Because some people might know. Well, it's an argument that you bring up, um, essentially. Like, as being a problem. As being a problem. And then you come up with a quitty, uh, you know, a very witty, like, you know, explanation, you know, or point based on the problem. But the, the fact is that the problem doesn't exist in the first place. Mm. Who are some proponents of the straw man theory? Well, uh, Wurzel Gummidge, obviously. <laughs> uh, the Scarecrow from, from Wizard of Oz. Oz. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, that Scarecrow from those movies um, about the Scarecrow that came to life. Yeah. Once every now and again. Jeepers Creepers. Jeepers no, creepers. he wasn't actually a Scarecrow. What? No, he was a demon. You're thinking there's one scene in the first film where he pretend he's hanging on. Are you on, serious? On, yeah. He's is not that a, a Scarecrow? No, he's a demon. He's a demon who he lives. He isn't always a Scarecrow. No, he's a demon who lives in a little hovel by a cornfield. Are you sure? I've seen two of those films. All oh, right, I'm, I reckon I've seen them all, and I didn't realize he wasn't always a scarecrow. No, he's a demon who lives underground for like no, twenty years at a time. Probably a little bit late in this podcast to get into a Jeep. No, Creepers fuck, it's not. Let's do it. Jeepers Creepers is a two thousand and one American horror film written and directed by Victor Selva. Oh shit, yeah. The film takes its name from the 1938 song Jeepers Creepers, which is featured in the film. Where'd you get those papers? Francis Ford Coppola executive produced the film. That's right. And the film stars a whole bunch of people. Oh, Justin Long. Justin Long's in it. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Trish Jenner and her brother, brother Darry, Darry, are traveling home from college for a spring break. As they drive through the Florida countryside, an old rusty truck tries to drive them off the road. The vehicle eventually passes them, and they later see the same truck pass next to an abandoned church with a man sliding what appears to be a body wrapped in a bloodstained sheet into a large pipe sticking out of the ground. (laughs) Wow, you are engrossed. Look at you. You just took a sip of your beer then because you're like, what happens next? The man (laughs) notices Trish and Darry watching him and attempts to run them off the road a second time. Okay, so he's not a scarecrow. After escaping, Darry convinces Trish to go back to the church and investigate. At the church, Darry hears noises coming from within the pipe and crawls inside with Trish holding onto his feet, but he ends up falling in after being startled by a swarm of rats. At the bottom, he finds a dying man with stitches running down his stomach and hundreds of other bodies sewn into the walls and ceiling. Yeah, that's a great shot. Do you remember that shot? I do remember. After Derry escapes, the two flee the scene and attempt to contact the police at a diner. At the diner, they're phoned by a strange woman who warns them they are in danger. There's always a strange weirdo in those isolated kind of like thriller horrors. There's always some weirdo who's like, you can't go in there. That's where the bad things happen. I'm exposition woman. (laughs) Confused and frightened, they travel. The police learn that the church has caught fire and any evidence of bodies has been destroyed. Yeah. The police are then attacked and killed by the mysterious trucker. That's awesome, that scene. Who loads their bodies into his truck. Cuts their head off, I believe. 
Fleeing, Trish and Darry stop at a reclusive old woman's house and beg her to call the police. The woman complies until she notices the driver hiding in her yard. She attempts to kill him, but the driver kills her and reveals his inhuman face. Oh, you're right. Okay. He's a demon, motherfucker. To Trish and Darry before pursuing them once again. Trish runs the driver over with a car, but they are horrified to see a giant wing tear through his trench coat and flap frantically in the air. They drive to the police station where they're approached by the psychic uh, Giselle. Ah, oh, that's Hartman. right. That's the worst character in the film. Uh, she reveals herself as the woman who called them at the diner and tells them the true nature of their pursuer. It's an ancient creature known as the Creeper. Like, that's really unimaginative. If he's ancient, they've had thousands of years to come up with a name. It's called Jeepers Creepers, so it's called the Creeper. It couldn't be called the Jeeper. No, but wouldn't it be called like Amotip or something like that? Some kind of ancient Which translates Sumerian. As the, the Creeper. creeper. <laughs> So from when the creeper was like at primary school, kids were calling him the creeper. Like that was one of those, it's like, you know, that Seinfeld joke, you call your son Jeeves. You're right. only going to be one thing. You call a kid the creeper. What do you expect? Yeah. I was just born into a long family of creepers. <laughs> I didn't even want to be a creeper. But when you've got it in the business and dad wanted me to be a creeper so much, I actually wanted to do plays. I just wanted to go to Vegas and be a dancer. Amateur theater really was my vibe, <laughs> but apparently. Got to go out and murder teens every 20 years. So this is the bit. This okay. is the, I guess that was what I was trying to get to because that's the two things I remember. One of them, it turns out wrongly, was that <laughs> he was a scarecrow. <laughs> no, but there's a scene. It's a really good scene. Isn't there? Where they're getting a, chased a bus or something? Maybe, a, you know what? It's actually the second, the second film. one. And the, there's the all these people kids. on a bus and they get... The school kids, yeah, the bus I, breaks that's down. That's what I'm remembering. There's a, I'm remembering he's hanging the creepers too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. All right. So You're actually making me want to go back and watch these films again. Well, I saw... At least Jeepers Creepers 2 at the cinema. So. Oh, shit, did yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Amy and I went through a period where we uh, we loved a horror shitty film. horror film. Yeah, right. Final well, that was Destination. But that's because like there that. there's more of them. Yeah. Back then. Back in the old days. Now right? they're all the same one. Oh, my house is haunted. Oh, my kid's weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Reed... Can you dummy up a horror poster where the film is called My House is Haunted and My Kid's Weird or My House is Haunted or My Kid's Weird? <laughs> Paranormal activity style writing or poltergeist or something. That's amazing. My House is Haunted and My Kid's Weird. <laughs> Fucking wow. It's a genre. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, you know what The Exorcist that's what makes it the perfect film because it's right. both yeah the house is like when the priest turns up he's like what's the problem he's like well my house is haunted my fucking kids, kids weird. weird what are you talking about <laughs> it's obvious mate <laughs> the big two <laughs> haunted house weird kid <laughs> check check get an exorcist get the holy water get this place sprayed <laughs> right. fucking pope make a sign of the cross whatever do we really need to have a discussion? My house is haunted. Yeah. My kid's weird. Number one, number two. <laughs> Tick all the criteria. Get your fucking holy water, champ. <laughs> you may get covered in vomit. In right. fact, I guarantee you'll get covered in vomit. Mate, it's going to happen. And I'm not sure because of the weird kid or the haunted house. <laughs> uh, at some stage, the walls will bleed. Uh, just put up with that. There'll be some weird chiropractic stuff, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Some implied stuff. Yeah. If she sticks a crucifix in her vagina, I'm sorry about that. She's a weird kid in the house is haunted. A weird kid in the house is haunted. One or the other, maybe. We're not sure. One could be as a result of the other. It turns out there's no problem. Yeah. He's just a really bad no. parent. Oh, yeah. Or I'm a terrible parent. So we've got three options. The house is haunted, the kid's weird, or I'm a derelict dad. So it's one of the big three. <laughs> oh no I'm a terrible parent sorry that's you know what that does make more sense than the house being haunted that, that, whole, that whole scene takes yeah. place in a police station it's just a guy just a deadbeat dad standing at the counter talking to a cop that whole conversation <laughs> my house is haunted my kids are weird or I'm a terrible dad you explain it to me I'm not drunk is that heroin and needle in my arm yes it's heroin because my house is haunted yeah. the ghost did it <laughs> Oh, my weird kid. My weird kid did it. Oh, guys. Uh, sir, are you sure you didn't put that uh, needle in your arm yourself? Are you, are, you, are you sure you're not high right now? Is your phone ringing? No. Oh. I'm getting a real buzzing. 
Oh, really? Maybe it's all the talk about ghosts maybe, yeah, is interfering is. with the podcast. Oh, is this, like a, this is like an episode of um, Ghost Hunters, one of those paranormal activity shows. I'd love to do one of those shows. They, oh. did, they did one a few years ago called, like, it's like Celebrity Ghost Hunt, where they got like eight celebrities who were like, who was the most famous person? Fuck. I okay, think so Evander I, Holyfield was I one of them. I turned off my phone and um, it's still, well, you're still, I'm hearing still getting a buzzing. little buzzing. Can, do you think people at home can hear it? Well, it feels like the sort of thing that they would hear, but maybe, I don't know. Could Are you it just think be that we've headphones? evoked some kind of, my house is haunted, my kid's weird? I mean, it's not, maybe if you say it three times. Have we connected to the afterlife? Is that what like, you're saying? But is there any chance, like in you know that sort of classic horror mm. trope, that we have just funnily enough, because this is that be the combination start of, the movie. of words. Like as long as you don't say my, my house, house is haunted and my kids, and my weird, kids weird, weird, yeah, three times in a row, we've done it, and that's actually what it does. And we said it because that'd always be the first scene, yeah, like where you just jokingly say something yeah. that evokes. It's the like ring. The, Did you hear? There's a videotape that if you watch it, you die. Die. Yeah, that's us. So what happens now? You know, and it's, you know what? And it's also the ring it's the raining outside. This has turned yeah. into a horror episode of Tofop. I'm scared. <laughs> In the modern day, it wouldn't be a videotape for the ring because videotapes are old fashioned. It'd just be one of those links that will say, this video will change your life. <laughs> <laughs> you won't believe what happens, happens next. next. <laughs> you become a demon. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Um, all right, so every 23 years, this yeah. was the bit I wanted to get to, but we will get to this, the sequel as well. Actually, let's just have a quick pause yeah. uh, to see if this... Um, I might turn it on and off and just see if that okay. uh, helps the buzz. So I've turned it on and turned it off in the hope that, you know... Can you hear any eerie... No, not at the moment. So maybe that's that's all you need to do to get rid of your ghost, yeah, guys. Yeah, fuck holy water. The Catholic Church has had a bloody monopoly on this business for too long. Maybe they dress it up with the holy water. Yeah, I was going to say. No, it's like a turn... You've just got to turn, turn it, it on, on and off. off. Yeah. But they realise that's not worth the $150 an hour call-out fee. How do you turn a soul on and off? I mean, no, I reckon there's just like literally a button in the house. I think I turned my soul... Off when I downloaded a Limp Biscuit CD off uh, iTunes. I'm oh, oh. not a CD a song. Hang on, why? Why did you do that? Why I downloaded the song? Yeah. Oh, because I was going through a phase of like nostalgia of the WWF. Oh, and I yeah, used to okay. like when the Undertaker yeah. would come out to Roland. I was like, oh, that's a good song. I think I'd, that'd be a fun song for me to listen to. But I did feel like I turned my soul off from that purchase. By the way, it is now raining quite heavily outside, so it does. It help. is horror. Oh, it's a good time to talk about horror films. Horror films. So let's get back to. Um, a Jeepers Creepers. Okay, so the when we laughed, last left our heroes, the cops had been killed. Yeah, now we, we, we need to know about that because the Creeper has a... The Creeper only comes out every now and again. So the Creeper hunts every 23rd spring. Right. So does that mean every 23 years or 24? Well, 23rd... Every like 23rd... 23, yeah. It'd be that, 23 years. To be honest, even that's a confusing number, isn't and it? And is he traveling? Because if you're in Australia and like it's like the 20th... Autumn in Australia. So he, Only reaps in autumn in Australia. Or maybe he travels he could, the world, so it's always I was gonna spring. S- well, oh, he could, no, or what he could do in is... In that year, he has his own spring break, <laughs> where he literally travels around the world reaping. Yeah. Uh, you just see this guy... Creeping, with, sorry. You just see this creeping gi- and reaping. You just see this giant black demon with bat wings in like board shorts down in like Cancun yeah. partying with a spring bunch of break! dudes. Yeah. You're all going to die. Yeah. I mean, they should have... <laughs> see you guys in 23 years. Seriously. Jeepers Creepers 4. We do a reboot of Jeepers Creepers, spring break. right? And we do Jeepers Creepers Spring Break. And you see the Creeper at fucking Spring Break. Because that's amazing. his prime creeping time. Yeah. <laughs> I think you don't have to be the Creeper to be a Creeper well, at Spring would, Break. That would be I'm sure of, there's lots of Creepers No, but that there. would be one of the kind of like subplots where like there's an actual Creeper as well. Yeah. And so sometimes we don't know if the scares are coming from the... The Jeeper Creeper. The, 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 20, the, actual the 23 year old is hanging out. Yeah, creepily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of creepers. That's yeah. the kind of. Okay, so we do a yeah, remake like of Jeepers creepers, creepers in which there's no demon. Spring break. It's just about 23 year old guys Creepy who guys. go to spring break. Every, yeah. Or 23 years like after they should. Yeah. So they're all like actually. 46. Yeah. 46 year old creepers. Every 23 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You can do it like the Seven Up series as well. Like we can see them as twenty-three year olds, as forty-six year olds, and then as sixty. 
Well, nine it's, a, it's a group of guys who are going back to spring break 23 years after one of their friends was killed by the Jeeper Creeper at right. spring break. Yeah. And they go back 23 years later to have this like anniversary, but also to investigate the, the, um, mystery, the mystery of whether there is a Jeeper Creeper or not. But through the process, you realise that some of them have indeed become their own okay, so Jeeper let's, Creepers. So let's say the Creeper is in it. So there's a Creeper and there's yeah. the Creepers. Yeah. The Creepers are the guys. Yeah. It's and like the Creeper a, it's is too, the... It's too like, you know, you've got a kind of A story and a B story. Yeah, totally. But they're both about Creepers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a social message. And you know what? Movie. It should turn out that the Creeper is actually... There's all been a us. huge... We've all been the No, creeper. there's been a huge misunderstanding. He hasn't actually been going out and dismembering teens... Everyone that he took was someone who had like a, it was a, it was a limb that was going to develop cancer or something. He had foresight to go. Or maybe oh. it's one of those things where he's been sent from the future, and all those people are going to be responsible for really bad things. So he's the equivalent. All oh, right, the Jeeper Creeper. Yeah, he's the guy who goes and kills back to Hitler. Kill Hitler. Yeah. All right, that's how we redeem him. You find out that every single person he killed. Was... I don't know if we have to need to redeem the Creeper. I think for sequel potential, we want the Creeper to. Okay, it's too early in the franchise yeah, to redeem exactly the Creeper. To, yeah, no, at no. some stage though, we have to bring the Creeper together with our heroes. Yeah, exactly. But are our heroes heroes? Aren't they Creepers? Well, that's the fucking point. In the first one, it, we find out that the humans are actually the Creepers. Yeah. Well, no, maybe like I mean, we we understand that they're both creepers, but maybe sometime down the line we'll realise that we're actually on the side of the creeper, not the people. Did you see the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street remake? Yeah, and they did a little twist to the backstory, which I think was completely ruined. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that ruined the film, but it was just like got the character so wrong. Which one was that? Well, tell me. Where they Spoilers. changed Freddy Krueger in the original series, or at least in the original film, he became yeah. more of a kind of boogeyman later on. But yeah. in the original film, which is very unnerving and creepy, he was a child, a dead child yeah, molester, child molester who had been burnt to death. Yeah. And then in the reboot, they made him a child murderer. As ah. if somehow that was better. It is better though. <laughs> That's the weird thing. It's better. Like it shouldn't. It's still terrible. But the but the reason but, better. but the reason they did that is because they wanted to elicit some sympathy. Because there's a sequence where you see him getting like lynch mobbed, chased into a building and set on fire, and it's like he still murdered kids. Yeah, <laughs> like they, 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 don't they, make me like feel sad for this guy. I love how we make these moral and arbitrary judgments on those sort of things. Though it's like there would have been some executive going, we can't sell a doll of a fucking pedophile. But we can sell a child murder doll. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. People will love that. They'll buy the plastic claws. It'll be great. But if he's a pedophile. I was obsessed with Freddy Krueger when I was a kid. Like I had the yeah, glove I remember with when the I first stuff. saw. Well, that's the thing though. Like even, so essentially they merchandised a pedophile's glove. Well, a, they did a, pedophile, with, a pedophile's murder weapon. Yeah. That was like something that kids could buy. Hey, hey kids, you know what you want for Christmas this year? A pedophile's murder weapon. It is funny because there isn't, like, I know there's been a resurgence in horror, but like you said, it's fucking my house is haunted, my kid's weird. But in the 80s, like action films, where we had like Arnie and Bruce Willis and Sly Stallone, horror had icons. You had like uh, Freddy, Jason, Mike Myers, you know, Pinhead from Hellraiser or whatever. Like, and you're right, they were, they were the reason you went and saw the film. They were the heroes in a way. Right. But they were terrible... Terrible, horrible people. Yeah. Well, I mean, Freddie, they tried Original to... Original anti-heroes, kind of. Freddie, they ways. tried to soften. Like, Freddie went from being that horrible, dirty, child-murdering pedophile in the first film to being like Bugs Bunny. Right. <laughs> By the sixth and seventh he film. He had a lot of witty lines. Yeah, oh, like, yeah. witty lines and just, like, his... Cartoonish plots. Kind of semi-ironic deaths, you know, for right. people. Like, there's a girl's into fitness and so, like, you know, he breaks her arms and turns her into a cockroach and... But isn't that after a while when you've been murdering for a while? He's trying to check it just, out. Well, you're just going, you're trying to keep yourself interested. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to theme it. I'm going to have a theme this year. Yeah. It's like when you started on stand up, like your first show is probably just the best hour of your stand up. But mm. after a while, you're like, well, if I'm going to do this festival every year, I might start thinking about thematic work. Like, that's probably what Freddie was doing. But he was looking for an artistic <laughs> challenge and he's like, you know, dream murdering. But there's no, are there any horror icons of the last 15 years? Maybe the girl from The Ring or The uh, Grudge? Yeah, Ring of the Grudge. I would say, um, what about um, uh, Jigsaw? Um, Jigsaw from Saw, the Saw movies. The puppet. Yeah. But, yeah. That, but also that character, the idea that there's some sort of like... Yeah, I guess so. Um, what about... But I mean like as in... Like I don't... I, I mean Jigsaw, I don't really... Like Freddy Krueger was the burnt guy with the glove. Hockey mask, Jason. You know what I mean? Like, like what's the... When I think of like horror icons of the last... 20 years all i see is a little girl with hair hanging over her face because that's like 
the creepy kid you're talking about. But no one's created that Jeeper Creeper type character. Who's the next horror rock star? I mean, that is a good point. The, the, have we just I mean, we, we did Leatherface. on something that is missing from the industry, like a proper... Horror like rock horror star. Horror rock star. Like yeah. A, you know. Well, it just seemed to be like when I was a kid. Well, you the, need it. Like an occasion's good. That's why I thought like, well, dreams are good, obviously, Freddy Krueger style. Yeah. But that's why like Friday the 13th and Halloween work so well. Because, or, you know, the idea that every 23 years or whatever. I mean. Like some occasion where they, you can then check back in on their. But they tried it. Remember in the early 2000s after the horror boom started again after Scream. There was films like Valentine with, you know, David Boreanaz and um, Urban Legend. So everyone tried to create a boogeyman. I mean, even the kind of scream, the, the scream mask thing, that was as close to a boogeyman, but they didn't, no one quite nailed it. What's an occasion? What's an occasion that I hasn't mean, been... Thanksgiving, but I'm sure there's a Thanksgiving. I mean, yeah. everyone would be done. Silent Night, Deadly Night. Um, Australia Day. Australia Day. Yeah, what about a dude like, just going around hitting you with thong, just slapping you in the face with a thong? What about if it's some sort of like you know, indigenous like you know spirit that's ah, oh, it's like you've raised like, like a bunyip or something. Yeah, you've raised like you know some sort of traditional indigenous sort of like yeah reaper that reaps vengeance well, on people around Australia. But I think those geopolitical. I think those mythological ones actually exist, but to create like an iconic, charismatic, horror star, right. They had no one's done it. No, recently. you need like a. Well, did you see It Follows? It Follows is a really cool little horror film, but they don't have like if you'd taken It Follows and made, you know, like given it a singular kind of boogeyman or a reveal of a boogeyman. Oh, you know what? The It remake. They're trying it now. They're going to tr try and make Pennywise the new kind of rock star horror character. Okay, hang on. I've just googled best horror movies of the two thousands. So. Uh, 40 best horror movies of the 2000s. So let's see if there's okay. anything on this list that would fit gives, into gives a, us a rock star. of like a rock star. Uh, okay, so number 40, The Mist. Number 39, no. House of the Devil. No. Uh, number 38, Dawn of the Dead. No. Remake. No. Hills Have Eyes. No. Two remakes already. The Ring. Okay. The Ring, kind of. Yeah. Splinter. No. Uh, Saw. Okay, so Saw at number 34. Yeah. So maybe Jigsaw. Um, inside, uh, Final Destination. So yep. there was no big bad in Final Destination. Big, no. The big bad was the death. death, and death was coming for them. Uh, Eden Lake, uh, Triangle, Triangle, um, the Australian film, Drag Me to Hell. Oh yeah, Jack, oh, Sam Raimi. Like that. That there's no that one fun. singular boogeyman in that. No, either. the others. Yeah. Uh, Martyrs. Don't Jennifer's know. Body. What? Uh, which which I is the like best that. horror. I like it, but that's not really yeah. a horror film. Is Trick it? or treat. Um, Trick or treat's not the last twenty years. Is orphan. It? Yeah. Uh, all right, hang on. Let's give go. me the top ten. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to <laughs> get through. It's one of those lists that's not in a. They've got a lot on each of the entries, right. so it's like one of those things where I'm like, I'm trying to fucking flick through. <laughs> that um, battle royale. Okay, well, yeah, but they're not horror movies like the Hunger Games movies, but they do have big bad villains in them. But uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Yeah, there's no boogeyman. No. Uh, Trouble Every Day. No. Um, all right. Uh, Wreck. I don't know. That's Wreck. the uh, found footage type one. Uh, okay. Lake Mungo. Like Mungo, hang on, where is this list from? Like Mungo, the Australian film yeah. that was made for like ten thousand dollars. Ginger Snaps. Yeah, werewolf film. Behind the by... Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. That is a great film. Oh, is it? But it's not really. That's a horror comedy. Yeah, that's okay. a really good film. Uh, twenty eight days later and twenty eight weeks later. What they both get in? Yeah, because I think there's a, a vast kind of difference between the quality of those. They two They put films. them in as one entry. That's bullshit. Shutter. Shutter Island. So now we're at the top ten. Oh, okay. Well, now in 10th place, The Orphanage. Yeah, that's like a Spanish film or something, yep. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, number nine, Bubba Hotep, which I didn't think it was like a horror film. That's more like a comedy is film. Is that Bruce right? Campbell? Yeah. This list is bullshit, by the way. Number I'm... eight, The Devil's Backbone. But my point, it kind of, the point is we've read through a lot of horror there's movies no and there's no sort of boogeyman. American Psycho. What? It's not a horror movie. 
You know what the you know what we were uncovering. So I watched a horror film last week called uh, Lights Out. Yeah, and it was cool. It was a really good film, and the the concept being that there was this demon woman haunting this family. Every time you turn the lights out, she would appear. She lived in the shadows. Right. But again, she had no identity. Like I think the difference between horror films now and the horror films we grew up on was those. It's all I mean, implied now. Implied yeah, horror. but I, I guess. But Jason doesn't really have a personality. No. But there, but there's something quite iconic. Maybe it's because those films started the genre, the un- unstoppable death machine, that because every facsimile, how can you imprint more than the original? You know what I mean? I mean, well, I just think there's an opportunity here to like You've create a great boogeyman. Yeah. So um, how do you do that then? Well, see, I, okay, so you know the first Nightmare on Elm Street, right? Yeah. So Freddy is not the Freddy that everyone knows. In that film, he's kept in the periphery like you don't you learn about his backstory through the teenage girl doing right. research and stuff he doesn't explain it or have monologues he's mainly a creepy shadowy character so are you saying create that character to yeah. kickstart and, this? and it's got to be big performance it's like the cameo performance that is actually the big performance of the film right you know like you know the, the iconic character but not necessarily the person who has the must scream Michael Shannon I don't know what the story is right. or what the plot we is, stuck, but and, we cast Michael Shannon. Untitled Michael Shannon project. horror film. Horror film. Let's just go to a studio. I guarantee yeah. we go to a studio now. We say yeah. Michael Shannon. Our idea horror, is rock star horror movie. Yeah, Michael Shannon, the next rock star horror movie. Here's your check. Here's ten billion dollars. <laughs> like, ten billion. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not great with numbers. Sorry, we'll no. take over from here. <laughs> My partner, uh, first of all, uh, will take the lesser of the offers and second of all, has no concept of what money is. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to go to Jeepers Creepers 2 and then we'll finish up. Um, so Jeepers Creepers uh, 2, because that's I think is the one I'm thinking Well, about. I mean, look, I'll, I'll sum up the first Jeepers Creepers film. They kill the cop, they run about for a bit. Uh, the sister gets kidnapped, the brother saves herself, and the monster gets to keep his face. Uh, so, same director, same writer, back for Jeepers Creepers 2. Yeah. Um, so, uh, here we go. Three days after the events of the first film. Yeah. Okay. The Creeper disguised... Because you understand why it's three days after, because he's only got a certain amount of time to feed before he has to go to sleep for 23 years. That's why he should go to spring, spring break, break, where there's heaps more people. Uh, Three days after the events of the first film, the Creeper, disguised as a scarecrow... Ah, finally! There you go. There's your vindication. ...abducts young Billy Taggart in front of Taggart Senior and Billy... So, if you're at high school and your surname's Taggart, Taggart. do you think you get any horrible nicknames? it's fine, mate. (laughs) Don't worry about it. Fine if your name's Taggart. Uh, The following day, a school... Not as bad as his best friend, Billy Rocksucker. (laughs) Taggart and Rocksucker. They're my lawyers. Uh, The following day... (laughs) A school bus carrying a high school basketball team and cheerleaders suffers a blowout after one of the wheels is hit by a handcrafted shuriken. Yeah, it's like a ninja star. Shuriken. Shuriken? Shuriken, I think. Shuriken? Yeah. Uh, Made out of bone. Oh, yeah. So a bone ninja star. Uh, Cheerleader Minxie. Are you going to do anything at high school but be a cheerleader if your name is Minxie? That's not her real name, I'm sure. Has a vision of Minxie, as in M-I-N-X. M-I-N-X-I-E, Minxie. That's a nickname. Cheerleader Minxie has a vision of Billy and Darry Jenner, the Creeper's That's victims the, from the first yeah, film, yeah, yeah. Uh, who both attempt to warn her about the Creeper in a vision. Oh, so, so Zach, a, Zach Snyder's uh, <laughs> so, first job. Let's have a dream hey, sequence that actually makes no logical sense. Right, yeah, that gives exposition for a movie that could have never possibly explain. Uh, which then blows out another tire, disabling the bus. Hang on, the vision blows out a tire. Yeah, the vision blows out a tire. What? How? F- through its vision. Power. Power. Okay, sure, that makes sense. Uh, with the party stranded, the creeper abducts the coaches and bus driver and singles out several of the occupants: Dante, Jake, Scotty, Bucky, and especially Double D. <laughs> oh, is that a guy or a girl? Don't know. Minxie has another vision in which Derry explains. <laughs> Oh, shit. You know what? Why are you Hang having on. these fucking you visions? Forgot to, you forgot to explain <laughs> yeah. everything you need to in the first vision. <laughs> Darry's back. Like, surely if Darry's coming... Nah, hang on. Let me... Okay. 
All right, this works. You've seen, Why? You've How seen, does this work? You've seen Pet Cemetery. You've seen yeah. uh, uh, Werewolf in London. In both those films, there's someone who dies who comes as an advisor right. to the next person to say, hey, watch out for this shit. That's what this is. It, it's written poorly because it's written as visions. If he'd been like a phantom or some kind of, you know, if it had appeared as a ghost or whatever, you'd allow it in the genre. So you're saying, yeah, but here's the thing. Here's my question. Is my, I'm questioning not that initial presumption that somebody in this world you've created can return from the dead to give you a message, right? Mm -hmm. My question is, why is that person not imparting all the important information in the first message? Like the first time you come back, because why are you holding on to extra information so that you're like, oh, I'll have to come back in another vision? No, because what you're doing is you're, as the phantom, you're floating in to say, hey, Will... Don't fucking sign with that guy because that will lead to your demise. Right. And then you, for whatever reason, fucking the guy convinces you and you sign. I have to come back and say, dickhead, I said don't sign with that guy. Now you're going to have to do this because that guy's got your signature and that's going to lead to this fucking problem. Yeah, but here's my issue with what's been going on here. Because when Darry comes back in the vision the first time, it's the one against the creeper. Yeah. And then when Darry comes back the second time, it's to explain that every 23rd spring for 23 days... Oh, okay, that should have been imparted in the first visit. That's Don't hold on to that for the second right. visit, Darry. Maybe Darry... Lead with that. But maybe... By the way, beware of the you creeper. It's this thing that comes mate, out every 23 Have you years. never been on the phone to someone and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, meet us here, blah, 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 and then you hang up, you're like, oh, fuck, hang on. Oh, yeah, sorry, 7.30. We're meeting at 7.30. Like, oh, that's all Darry's doing. Oh, no, hang on. Sorry, I forgot. It's uh, a mythical creature that arises every 23 years for 23 days. I did actually... That slipped my mind in this vision that I'm coming back from the dead to impart to you. I must admit, I should have written a list on my hand. I should have made some notes. I had a big night last night. I, I, I was partying with Jimi Hendrix and Kurt Cobain. You know and what? look, we get loose up in heaven. It gets tell loose you, right. up here. Yeah, yeah. Um... All right, so uh, <laughs> turns out they're fine with masturbating too. In fact, I got an extra hand. What do you think I'm doing right now? Right now. In this vision? That's not a ghost noise. <laughs> People think it's, ooh, it's orgasm. And that's right. not ectoplasm. Right. You know why we wear white? <laughs> so... Uh. Uh, so Mixie has another vision where Derry explains some more plot points. Every 23rd spring for 23 days... The creature emerges. Every 23 minutes in this film, Derry appears. Every 23 appears. minutes in this film, I will remind you what the plot of this film is. Uh, it hunts for specific body parts. Oh, yeah, that's right. We forgot yeah. to mention that in the first one. Which it then consumes in order to replace it, its own. So oh, yeah. So, all right, I forgot. The last shot of the first film is that the brother sacrifices himself to save the sister. And the last shot is the, his skin. So he's been skinned. His skin's hanging on a rack. And then the creeper comes up behind his skin and looks through his eye holes with his eyes. So the creeper has skinned him, taken out his eyeballs, and now has a nice new pair of dairy balls. And so why? Eyeballs, dairy eyeballs. Why is that, by the way, then? Why is that any worse than what we do to animals? I mean, we were no, like skinning... look, here we go. Fucking Captain Vegan here. We skin animals to wear them to protect us from, like, if you knew as a creature that your only way to survive was to skin these things, you'd probably looked at as animals so that you would have like this protection and warmth for you to survive. Is that not an unreasonable thing for the, the creeper to want to do? I don't think so. That's how we get some sympathy. Well, it's the, the it's, it's, a, well, you could argue you're like, if you didn't want to get skinned by the creeper, don't go into his territory. Well, That's where the creeper. Now, well, now you're victim blaming. Well, no, you like can't it, victim blame creeper victim. Hang on, how many, how many, like uh, you know, biologists and stuff have been bitten Shouldn't by sharks? Shouldn't have been out there, should you? And, those, those and they say we don't need to go kill the shark for biting right. me. I went into his territory, so it's like, sure, oh, my, my child was dismembered, <laughs> and this creeper is now wearing his eyeballs. But he went into his territory, you know and what? I think yeah, <laughs> like it'd be great if the parents were really like they just came out like, very PC. Now, obviously, we're we're devastated that our son was killed by a creeper, but we acknowledge that my son was in a creeper's area, and creepers are gonna creep. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, so as Bill Cosby taught us, <laughs> creepers gonna creep, and uh, we don't want you to kill the creeper. Yeah, uh, the creeper only does this every twenty-three years. It's part of a pro natural process. Yeah, uh, we just recommend that in the, the we'll, we'll keep a calendar. Yeah, we'll put a little alert on, and we'll just keep out of the creeping zone. And also, um, uh, Derry 
was short-sighted. Uh, so we have these glasses. If someone does see the creeper, creeper, he may need these if he wants to watch TV. Yeah, and also, oh, sorry, if I could also say this. I'm just getting another message from Derry. He said that the, car, the TV remote is behind the couch. <laughs> sorry, you just, it's very forgetful. There's a list of things he needs me to pass on. It's very annoying, to be honest. <laughs> Can't wait to be creeped. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, after hearing numerous p- police reports, the Taggarts go hunting for the Creeper <laughs> and make radio contact with the school bus. The Creeper attacks Bucky and is injured, then kills Dante using his severed head as a replacement for its own. The students oh, leave yeah, the bus right. when they're there again attacked and chased into a field where the Creeper kills Jake and takes Scotty. After the Creeper attacks Bucky at the bus again, Taggart shoots it with a homemade harpoon. Yeah. Yeah, so that's awesome. The ha- uh, Taggart's dad, I believe, is Taggart's Ray Taggart. Wise from uh, Twin Peaks, who's uh, oh, nice. a Leyland Palmer, yeah, the guy who good. murdered Laura. He's yeah. awesome. Spoilers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As the reboot is about to be launched. <laughs> Taggart uh, shoots it with a homemade harpoon. However, the creeper I'll shoot you with my homemade harpoon, if you know what I mean. flips the truck. Izzy, Rhonda, and Double D attempt to escape in a truck and are chased by the Creeper. The Creeper's always after a Double D. Yeah. Uh, causing the vehicle to crash. Mean, uh, despite missing an arm and a leg, uh, the Creeper continues to stalk Double D. Yeah. This, I bet the Creeper went in the bar later. He's always like, you know, it cost me an arm and a leg, <laughs> but it was worth it. Uh, the Creeper continues to stalk Double D until Taggart intervenes by shooting it with a harpoon again. Yeah. Taggart repeatedly stabs... Hang on, was it a homemade one or was this the professional made one? I don't know if one? they had a shop bought one. Yeah, like shop bought har- harpoons? <laughs> Where do you fucking buy a harpoon from? <laughs> like, if I said to Will, meet yeah. me tomorrow at midday yeah. and bring a harpoon, where would you fucking start? eBay. Really? Yeah. Use Google, harpoon. can you go on yeah. eBay right now eBay a harpoon. and see if we can That's eBay right. a harpoon? That's going to be a Patreon level. If you can get us to a certain amount, we'll buy a harpoon. Okay, firstly... Uh, harpoons, eBay. Uh, so there is uh many harpoons. Oh my god! Out available on eBay. How much are they? Uh, well, for anything from like a smaller sort of harpoon. No, we want a big one. Fishing. We want one big enough to shoot a creeper. Okay. So what we're probably looking for is an antique whaling harpoon. Yes. All original, nineteenth century. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, we'll need about uh, $1,600 for a oh, oh, vintage, oh, here we go, vintage, oh, vintage whale harpoon, maritime whaling toggle spear and fishing three-piece set, which yes. we don't really need. No, but, but it sounds cool. It sounds cool to get the set. Yeah. Uh, 2500 <laughs> I reckon we can afford that. Tell him he's dreaming, mate. <laughs> Yeah, no. Again, Charlie. Like, let's not let's take, buy a harpoon. Let's not take whatever oh, come on. small profits we got from this podcast <laughs> and spend them on harpoons in case 23 years from now we happen to be in a field. <laughs> well, we bought the harpoon. So we thought, that would be the one day you didn't pack the harpoon, uh, but, I bet. Oh, ah. I thought you were bringing the you harpoon. You said you were going to bring the harpoon. Uh, now this demon's going to bloody chop us up. Can't believe this is Although we are in his territory, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Creepers get a creep. <laughs> All right, we should stop talking. Well, just to round up Creepers too. what happens? Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, I don't want to hang, leave, leave people hanging. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, missing an arm and a leg, Creeper continues to stalk Double D until Taggart intervenes by shooting it with a harpoon again. Taggart repeatedly stabs the Creeper in the chest and face... But the creature goes into a hibernation state That's before it can right. die. 23 years later, a group of teenagers drive to Taggart's farm, where the creeper is a sideshow attraction. <sighs> they notice Taggart watching it with a harpoon gun at his side. When they ask him if he's waiting for something, Taggart looks up at the creeper and says, About three more days, give or take a day or two. Ah, uh, yeah! Jeepers creepers. <laughs> uh well, what a great uh what a great journey today's podcast. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you've heard it all. Um, if you'd like to support the show, please go to patreon.com forward slash TOFOP. Uh, Patreon is a subscription service in which you can support the show for any amount of money, Will. Um, from a dollar up to... Uh, I'm going to look up the box office of a Jeepers Creepers 2. Yeah. Uh, and that will be our number for this week. Uh, it made... Uh, so, for anywhere from... Uh, $1 to... $63.1 million. Yeah, we'll take that. Well, you know what? 63.2. If you have been more amused by us doing this podcast and watching Jeepers Creepers 2, then, in fact, I feel like you owe us $63.1. <laughs> it's a very popular sequel. I don't know you should really put those conditions on it. How much do you reckon Jeepers Creepers 3 made? Just Is there a three? Is there a third? Yeah, I've seen I, the first two. Yeah, I reckon there was definitely a third. No, I don't think you're right. I would have seen it. Uh, all right, here we go. Jeepers Creepers 3, Wikipedia. Oh, no. Up. Oh! Oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Is this a footnote? All right. Do we need to do another hour? <laughs> Jeepers Creepers 3 is an upcoming Reboot. 2017 American horror film directed by Victor Selva. Oh, fuck. He's back. <laughs> Victor's back. And takes place between Jeepers... Charlie, we've stumbled upon it just a little a bit of gold here. So Jeepers Creep Creepers 3 actually takes place between in those two. three days between Jeepers Creepers Of and course, Jeepers because Creepers the Creepers two. fucking... Oh, the Creepers got hibernating, like hibernating or about to be shot. No, 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 because it has to be between the two. Yeah, because... but that's what I'm saying. But I thought they'd just go... Otherwise, 20... it has to be futurist... But I thought they'd just go 23 years later. You pick it up where you... No, because, the... because Daddy Taggart has got the harpoon pointed at the creature at the end of two. So as soon as it wakes up, he's going to kill it. So if you're going yeah, to do... Yeah, but don't you start it from there. You start it from Taggart. No, because he's going to kill it and it's going to be dead straight away. Yeah, but away. something happens. He gets ah, distracted for right. a second. Yeah, he's like... Or Taggart has a I've been of... watching this thing for three days, but now's the time to take a sweet drink of my Pepsi Cola. Like, then... I mean, he's got to go to the toilet or something, or is he wearing like those, like, you know, the astronaut <laughs> who drove across America? Is he wearing like... Amazing. Adult he... diapers. Yeah, that's right. He's wearing adult diapers, but it's like, it'd be great if it was one of those kind of things where. You know how sometimes you can't stop looking at your phone? You're like, oh, you know. So he's just browsing. He's like, he right. gets an alert. And he's like, oh, what's Donald Trump said He's now? been there for three days. You can't tell me that he's not like checking his Twitter occasionally. <laughs> that's right? Funny. He's and sending was, a great tweet and, and that's watched, what boils I watched him. Survivor, by the way. And yeah, he's, he's like composing a really funny tweet. <laughs> yeah. like it's, he takes a photo of himself next to the thing and he goes, hashtag grim creeper. <laughs> yeah. like, the other day I had to pull the car over because I had such a great idea for a tweet. I actually pulled the car over because I was like, this can't wait five minutes for me to get home. I need to pull over so I can fucking this write this like, right now. He's not going to wake up really quickly. <laughs> I'm just going to finish this tweet. Next thing he knows, a creeper's got his head in his but mouth. But it's, yeah, it's set in between. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Breck will reprise his role as the creeper. Oh, so, Breck oh, thank, and, so there you go. Thank Christ. So it turns out Jonathan Breck, the is creeper, the new is our new sort of... Yeah. Uh, it's the third instalment. Yep, we get that. Uh, all right. Uh, what do we know? It has, hasn't been shot yet, though. No. Uh, plot. Here we know. Here's what we know about the plot. What? Set between the first and second film, Sergeant David Tubbs, Davis Tubbs, assembles a task force to destroy the creeper. Tubbs, tag it. This guy's got... Yeah. All right, go on. Destroy the creeper once and for all while growing closer than ever before to learning the secrets of its dark oh, sorry, So sorry. this is between one and two. Yeah. So we know the creeper's going to get away. Oh, uh, yeah. But it's kind of like, I mean, I guess this is their Rogue One. Prequel? Yeah, okay. But also at the end of Horror Creeper movies, One. <laughs> you... It's a fair point though, really. Yeah. Because the creeper doesn't look like it's just gone through something. At the no, he looks kind of relaxed. He's hanging out in a fucking scarecrow Well, pole. maybe that gets you right up to the point where he's on the scarecrow thing though. Yeah. So, like, Wouldn't Rogue, it be amazing if they, style, oh, if they link? see him like purchasing yeah. like, stuff to make You know it. what he's actually doing? He's auditioning for Godspell. Like he goes to an amateur theater and he sees there like doing auditions for Godspell. So that's why he's hanging on that post. People think he's a scarecrow. He's actually going, prepare you. <laughs> That would be it. That's like Jeepers said, Creepers 4. He never wanted to be in Creepy. He wanted to be in Amateur Theatre. It's all making sense now. <laughs> uh, set between the first and the second. So Tubbsy gets the task force together, Tubbsy's task force, uh, to learn the secrets of... <laughs> Sounds like a new Channel 9 renovation show. <laughs> to learn. We've got 24 hours to creep on some people. <laughs> 
<laughs> we put together a task force. Um, secrets of its dark origins as the monster terrorizes. Don't it. do it. This is what every fucking film does now, and it ruins it's it. Chlorins that made it a creeper. Don't. I don't know. I think I do want to know more about the creeper. Really? Yeah. Okay. Like, I'd love to see some flashbacks that 23 years ago, some other creeping it's done, to be honest. Well, that's a good idea. I mean, you right? could do the creeper through the years. Yeah. Would you do a future creeper film? I would. Well, I'd do one at least 23 years from now. Like, You know what you could stuff. do is you could tie up the creeper to, like, famous historical events yeah. or, like, Jack the Ripper. Like, it, was, it wasn't Jack the Ripper. It was the creeper. Jack the Creeper. Jack the Creeper. <laughs> that's what you call it. All right, Reed. We've got two movie posters for you to do this week. I don't think he's made it this far into the podcast, but um, okay. So uh, they're going to learn more about the creeper. Um, Gina Phillips from Jeepers Creepers One will make an appearance in the film. She's, I oh, know she survived. Yeah, that's uh, the sister from the first. According one. to Victor Salva, the origins of the creeper are set to be explored in the film. Okay, this whole plot summary is them saying the exact same thing over and over. Uh, the original truck. <laughs> From Jeepers Creepers. Oh, because the Jeeper Creeper, he had a he had a, like a, a, a like a character vehicle. Right. It was a creepy looking truck. Uh the original truck. By the him. way, like if he's only getting out a few days every twenty three years, who's keeping the rego on that? And like, it, is he having? Is he is he opening his mailbox and there's like fucking you know twenty three years worth of rego reminders? I just don't feel like he cares about rego. Oh, you creeper. don't think? No, he doesn't give a shit. He's he's creeping. Uh, the original truck from Jeepers Creepers 2. Th- by the way, this is how little anyone knows about this movie. This is in the plot section. Uh, the original truck from Jeepers Creepers is owned by a private collector in Maryland who keeps it in storage awaiting the filming of Jeepers Creepers 3. Wow, that's his fucking retirement plan. According- One day they're going to fucking rent this off me. I'm going to make a fortune. And the last line of the plot summary is, according to director Victor Selva, Jeepers Creepers 3 will be the most frightening Jeepers Creepers film. Oh, well, that's, that's, well, that, that, that's, there that. you go. Oh, hang on. Let's, I've got some production okay. notes. Um, the third film was in talks even before Jeepers Creepers 2 was released in 2003. Unfortunately, those talks have stalled a little. In 2006, the movie was announced and was tentatively called Jeepers Creepers 3 The Creeper Walks Among Us. Uh, it's got wings. They originally planned it to to direct to DVD, but were unable to find proper financing. Okay, so how the fuck has it gotten rebooted? The movie script. Oh yeah, blah blah blah. Okay, well, Where, he, what website the, are you on? By the, the new way? ones, uh, Wikipedia. Oh. The new ones called Jeepers Creepers. Where'd you get those papers? <laughs> <laughs> cathedral, Jeepers Creepers Cathedral. Ah. So there you go. All right. Uh, I feel like that's... We've done more than enough. More than enough. Oh, Jeepers Creepers 3, Cathedral, official trailer. Is this a real trailer? No. No. Oh, someone's oh, fan-made? I think it's someone's... Hang on, let's see if it's fan-made or not. It's got the warning up the top, but it feels like it's fan-made. That's from the old For film. 23 days. This is fan-made. Yeah, this These is are all shots from the old trailer. film. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, no, that's Ryan Court. Ryan that's Court. Wolf That's Wolf Creek. Yes. No, that's fan-made. They're just taking <laughs> horror films from everywhere. I was about to say, was he in it? No. No, it's okay. So wow, well, isn't it amazing fan-made. that like someone loves Jeepers Creepers so much they've made they've a made fan a trailer? Fan. Well, I mean, some people have heard of it enough that they spent 40 minutes in a fucking podcast talking <laughs> about it, so... I guess that'll do. Uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, do you have any shows to promote? Uh, I'm on the road a little bit in country areas. I think down near Newcastle and Wagga Wagga. Uh, Montreal Just for Laughs uh, Festival. I'm doing Critically Will, my show, as part of the Just for Laughs Festival over there. So, um, uh, Oh, I have a new episode of Willosophy uh, coming out next week. Um, Tim Ferguson from the Doug Anthony All-Stars. Um, uh, some people will know Tim uh, from his amazing comedy work. He also has MS. So it was a really cool... Um, catch up with Tim for the podcast so I'm going to put one of those out and we have a AFL football co- podcast called Two Guys One Cup an AFL football podcast and we've got to do it in the same place uh, recently yeah. and I feel like it's added to the quality 
Uh, we should also mention um, uh, our good friends, uh, Sam Kavanagh and Leon Shergren. Shergren. I listened to it very closely this yep. week. have a podcast called Am I Funny, which is uh, Leon's attempt to do stand-up comedy for the first time. And it's really good. Like, yeah, it's short episodes, only about 20 minutes each. But if you want to, if you've ever thought, like, why would someone get on uh, a stage and tell jokes, like, listen to this. Because and it's, uh, what uh, the kind of format is that, like, Leon's, like, he's, you know, he's worked in radio and stuff and production and he's done funny things. But the big kind of stumbling point to him has always been, like, stand up. And you often find that. Like, there'll be people who do comedy who still think that, stand up isn't necessarily what they want to do like it's it can be a step further than you know people want to do you can do comedy in much kind of safer environments than that and be very good at doing comedy in much safer environments than that um but he's decided he wanted to do it and he decided the way to do that was to do a like a podcast where he followed the steps uh through it i think initially he was quite confident (laughs) uh i think as he's talked to and this is the nice thing about the podcast if you want to hear what a whole bunch of now well-known comedians think about a the idea of doing a podcast like that but b the idea of how they felt at that time or what their reflections are on that time he's done a really good job of encompassing you'll hear from a wide variety of people at wide at at very different times of their career about how they view the process of getting into stand-up comedy so it's very interesting it's a really fun podcast and we really we highly endorse it yeah and i believe that uh, leon if you actually listen to the podcast and you want to see leon's live show he's performing at the lounge in yeah. surrey hills do you That's know that right. venue yeah, it's a good it's a good they do a little monday night thing yeah i believe there. i believe uh well you know leon is not great with dates i may get this wrong as well i believe it's monday the 29th of may um, so I'm going to go check it out. And uh, if you guys are listening to this show, you should check it out as First well. First time he's ever doing stand-up. And uh, they're making him do 10 minutes because Sam uh, <laughs> thought that five minutes didn't sound like enough. <laughs> I had a conversation with Sam because like... You know, he was Sam like, is the producer. He's the producer Kavanaugh. of the show. And he was like, he wanted it to be 15 minutes. <laughs> I was like, mate, we'll split the difference. If you want to make it really hard for him... 10 is heaps. Five is heaps. It might sound, it might feel like five hours when he's up there, five minutes. 10 is a lot to do for your, for your very first gig. So it'll be worth seeing how it goes. Yeah. So check out Am I Funny podcast. And uh, I'm Charlie Clawson. I'm Will Anderson.